Hey guys, thank you for checking out this episode. We'd love your support by heading to patreon.com forward slash freshly grounded. It really does make a difference in helping us continue making this content. And if not, no stress. Enjoy. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What's that? Oh. Guys, um. Hey. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Freshly Grounded, episode 196 or 97. Uh, this podcast is um, It's one that you're gonna Like not wanna listen to In the car with your family On speaker Do you know what I mean um, Alhamdulillah It's a very informative podcast um, It was uh, A pleasure having the brothers on uh, The brothers from My Tezkia My Tezkia is a platform Which basically helps people Who have an addiction To um, X-rated content And uh, All of the effects of it and it's an anonymous muslim therapy um company uh, i'm probably not doing it justice but i'm gonna leave the link for for them in the bio uh, but check them out and this this podcast is all about that and about the services they provide so very very interesting one guys uh, make sure you do check it out uh, also before you get into it remember the freshly grounded cards if you want to connect with your loved ones on a deeper level you you, you don't need the freshly grounded cards but you're going to want them you're going to want them. And you can get them at freshlygrounded.com forward slash the game. No, ah, I always get the link wrong. Freshlygrounded.com forward slash game. Let's check. Freshly grounded. Freshlygrounded.com forward slash game. No, it's not game. It's forward slash the game. Yeah. Freshlygrounded.com forward slash the game. And uh, it's a card, it's a conversation card, and the questions are built uh, and well thought out to hopefully trigger um, a, a, a deep conversation with you and your loved ones. So do check that out at freshlygrounded.com forward slash the game. And without any further ado, this is Freshly Grounded uh, with my task here. Let's get into the episode. And welcome. To Freshly Grounded, the brand new podcast by best friends Faisal and Sam. Huh? I welcome. I said welcome to Freshly Grounded. The, no, after that bit, the brand new podcast. And after that bit, by best friends Faisal and Sam. Really? All right. So, uh, Alhamdulillah, we are joined today with Abu Musa and. Uh, Yusuf Idrisi, who, 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 I still want to see the picture, bro. Oh, you want to see the yeah. picture? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't wait. We're joined by um, uh, Abu Musa and Yusuf Idrisi, alhamdulillah. Uh, you would have, you guys would have seen uh, Yusuf. I'm surprised we haven't had uh, Yusuf on a podcast before. I know that I've wanted to, but we haven't had uh, Yusuf on a podcast before. So, but, uh, alhamdulillah, for, oh, oh, have we? No, we haven't. Okay. We haven't. Because yeah. I, was, I was questioning myself there My for a second. My first ever podcast. Really? I, 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 literally, I, I do a lot of charity work, but in terms of engaging, have a conversation, speaking about real grassroots matters, is my first uh, podcast. Wow. Ever. Pleasure. Pleasure to be. Alham- well, it's a pleasure to be your, the first podcast that you're jumping on. Oh, no. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> All right. Um, so I, I want to see that picture. Apparently, Yusuf has a picture of me, um, him, when like from a few years back. So we're looking for that picture. But in the meantime, um, we are with the brothers. So the, the brothers are, are from my Tazkia, which we're going to go uh, and kind of get kind of an explanation on. I think uh, this is going to be a really insightful podcast. It's, a, it's obviously a very like deep and taboo subject, especially, I think, in... Um, our cultures but a subject that needs to be discussed and uh, uh, what I'll do is I'll actually hand it over to Abu Musa uh, to to give me a little uh, quick uh, elevator pitch or um, a uh, in a nutshell of what my Tazkia is Assalamu alaikum Jazakallah for having us on the podcast May Allah bless you Where is my brother? I have like a background in youth work so I was working with street actors, young people, suffering from drug and alcohol addiction. And this is um, going back about 10 years. Uh, I so think you might need to go close to your mic, sorry. Is that a bit better? Yeah, it should be. Go ahead. So there's a similar times that I started practicing as well, uh, alhamdulillah. And uh, there was this common problem kept on coming up. Right, you know, so because I was doing youth work, um, I would get people confiding uh, in me with, the, you know, this problem. And whether it was online forums, YouTube videos, on the, you know, on the internet, uh, this problem of pornography addiction. 
right? And, uh, you know, there was issues of drug addiction, alcohol addiction, various topics. But uh, this one really touched me because it was um, affecting, affecting marriages. You know, a lot of sisters complaining about finding their husband, uh, you know, watching pornography or whatever have you, or uh, finding out that they're visiting escorts and so on. Um, and I remember reading something back in, say, about 2013, uh, and it was an article online, and uh, a sister commented. She said, "You know, my my uh, she's found out about her husband having this problem, and she said, you know, I'm suicidal. I just want to drive, um, get onto the motorway, and drive into, you know, crash into something." And um, you know, these kind of stories kept coming up. So, alhamdulillah, you know, even Saad Yusuf, um, uh, you know, has a background with uh, working, with, you know, with people in in, in um, street active young people and so on. Um, so there was a few other brothers where we got together, alhamdulillah, and uh, we started working. I started working one-to-one -one with people uh, with these problems and applying those things that I'd learned, uh, you know, from my work as a youth worker, uh, as a teacher. And then, you know, doing a lot of research on uh, me mental health and especially pornography addiction within the Muslim communities, uh, we finally thought, you know what, we have to put ourselves out there. So it's a big elephant in the room. Um, it's a taboo subject, but someone needs to speak about it, right? You know, we can't just, uh, you know, people need us, people are crying out for help. So we decided to set up, it's been a couple of years, alhamdulillah, where we set up Mataski as a platform. And, uh, and the response was huge, subhanAllah, you know, so many people uh, coming and, you know, suffering from this problem, you know, which includes practicing, non-practicing people, you know, people active in the Muslim communities, uh, you know, whether it's dais, khadibs, imams, uh, and it's a very real problem. So alhamdulillah, through that experience, we were able to give a solution and we've been getting good results, alhamdulillah, with people. Alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. So h how long has it been around? And you know what, Ustad Yusuf, I think it's not <laughs> no, being I found. Got it. I got oh, it. you got I it. I found it. I was going to say, no, 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 I found it. No, forgive <laughs> me. So I found no, no. it. And I'm going to show it to you, inshallah. When you when you when you uh, deem suitable. No no let's see it let's see it. This is a relaxed. This is what I was trying to explain to you guys. Like this is not going to be interview based. Like Thank we want the audience to feel relaxed when they listen to Be Freshly Guarded. And if we want them to feel relaxed, we have a normal relaxed conversation, unedited. We talk about my test I don't, I don't know much more, but generally we're having a having a natter. So let's throw it up and then we'll get back to it. So here here's that photo, mashallah. You remember that? That like do you remember that? Or yeah yeah. Do you have, so do you have a um. Oh, subhanAllah, man. Don't that you remember? Back in the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm trying to Ali Dao was there. Yeah. Musa Adnan, myself, his brother. Man. Amen. There's yeah, Barif. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's Shaib. There's Uthman. Have you got Hussein. airdrop? Let me let me chuck it on the stream. Yeah, go on. Let me airdrop. This is there. He should say like Faisal's MacBook or something. Faisal's MacBook. Yeah, I got you. Faisal Chowdhury. Everyone is young, subhanAllah. Hey, yo, did you get it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show it to the, show it to the viewers. Alhamdulillah. The quality is not that great. To be honest, I, 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 it was in my phone somewhere. I couldn't find it. So I said, where's the, where's the, where, where am I going to find now. this photo? So He's I went go on, on the to, podcast, yeah? uh, you know, um, the famous black, yeah. mashallah, that we used to support. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Oh, man. It was good times, huh? Yeah. And um, that was like my first um, experience doing like, like all night is during Ramadan yeah, on, on telly. That was heavy, man. And I think I did the next year as well. I think I did two years after that. I did that one and then the year no, after and the year after. Oh, I did that one and just the year after. No, I think you've done that one in the year after, then you've done a solo thing for... I went on my own. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I've, got the, I've got the chicks on the street yeah, now. I'm going to You're standing up, <laughs> you the screen, you know. Alhamdulillah. May Allah bless you. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. And then this year I didn't do it. Yeah, no, you yeah. didn't. Wise move. Corona, you know, Corona was a special time. It was a special time to, to attach spirituality, to build that relationship on a personal level, just to... Mm. Bring, spend more time at home mm, with the mm. family, the missus, the kids. Yeah, I think it was my first. I think it was my first Ramadan with Zakaria, and I wanted this. Normally in Ramadan, like I switch my um, routine up a bit, mm. but this time I wanted to keep it a bit closer to a normal routine yeah. because I wanted. To, I didn't want to miss out on like key things in like helping with Zakaria. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm and so I knew that the all nighters on TV would have just completely that would lock that off. <laughs> you know how it is. Yeah, know <laughs> you know how it is bro. That yeah, that, that work is is blessed, but it takes a lot of energy. There's great <laughs> reward but there's great sacrifice. And with that sacrifice obviously there comes pros and cons. So, you understand? So. There's that opportunity cost always there like okay you're you're benefiting here, the Ummah here, but then 
maybe you're missing the upbringing mm. of Zakaria, mm. mm. or maybe mm. that special time you could have spent with the missus, or maybe Sah. that that mo- mother or dad you could have uh, went to see your visit. You understand? So there's always Sah. that in life. Sorry, sorry, sorry. But alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. With the, like, like you said, there's there's pros and cons to most situations. Um, okay, fine. So uh, now I'm glad that we got that picture out of the way. I'm breaking the set as we go. Um, okay, with my Tasikia then, let's get back to the let's get back to it. Um, how long ago was it started? And when you said you started it, Abu Musa, sorry, with the brothers, um, how many how many brothers was it that started it? And um, and when was that? And was it just like one to one counselling at first? Yeah, yeah. So uh, my Tazkiyah, it's been official for uh, since about 2017, alhamdulillah. But uh, privately, I was working with brothers for years, like I said, from 2010. And then when uh, you know it got more specific with pornography and sex addiction. That would, uh, I say, was about 2014, 15, alhamdulillah. And as time went on, you know, I would speak about this problem with people. So uh, we have um, another brother, Abu Yasin, um, another brother part of the team, Adil, uh, Ustad Yusuf, uh, who's part of the team. And alhamdulillah, we uh, have Ustad Ramiz Ibrahim. I don't know if you know him. He's a psychotherapist with over 17 years experience. Um, he's part of the team now. We have another brother called Abdurrahman. He's a coach, he's a teacher, and uh, also specializes in uh, you know, Muslim porn recovery, like you know, helping Muslims with uh, this addiction. Uh, and yeah, that's about it for now. So I, I noticed that you use the word addiction. Mm-hmm. Um, why is that? Addiction, because. Because the, 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 the stigma when you think of addiction, you, yeah. oh, for some reason, automatically what comes to mind is like alcohol, drugs, right? Mm-hmm. So, what is, brother, right? To be honest, there's some people, right, as haram as it is, as forbidden, we know it's forbidden and uh, we know the consequences and the problems that come from it, right? But some people may be able to watch this and have problem and they get married and it's not a problem anymore. Um, but then there's those people who is a serious problem for them, right? So that's why we class it as addiction. So the people who come to us, they know that is a problem. And addiction, if you were to define addiction, addiction is something that, you know, you use to cut off from reality, right? And you can't stop. You get so it's like, for instance, if you were to talk about pornography, a lot of people, you know, the people that I've uh, worked with, a lot of people come across it quite innocently, whether it is through his friends seeing something on the internet, a pop up, um, and they may not like it and they know it's wrong and so on. But what happens is when they keep on viewing it and so on, it's, it's dealing with the parts of the brain, the reward circuits, you know, the, the pleasure circuits of the brain. And they see that it's, you know, it has this uh, feeling of pleasure, right? They're getting some kind of feeling from it. And a lot of addicts, when you talk about addicts, tend to have these underlying issues that they, uh, you know, have, whether it's trauma, you know, whether it's childhood issues, depression, anxieties, whatever it may be. And then when you join the two together, they're seeing this something that is, you know, giving them uh, this escape from those problems at home, at school, whatever it may be, and it ties in together, and then that becomes an escape mechanism for them. All right, so then it becomes a release, and that's where the addiction starts. You know, where they start now using it to uh, escape their problems in life instead of dealing with them, you know, in a healthy way. Even even on that point as well. So if you if you look at an addiction generally, there's different types of addictions. So some, yeah, any uh, out out uh, general, you know, deposition. The nature that we have as human beings is that we're meant to be married. We're meant to have spouses. We're meant to have relationships. We're meant to have that bond with, you know, our wives or our spouses in the future. So that's a natural instinct that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he put within us. So generally, when we're speaking about addictions, you know, alcohol is something that or or smoking weed or cocaine is not something where you have an innate, you know, instinct with inside you where you're like, okay, all right, I need to smoke or I need to take cocaine or I need to drink alcohol. These are gradually built in, in one's life after a process of being exposed to these things. Mm-hmm. Whereas generally when you reach a certain age, of course, same with pornography, I don't think yeah, I mean, naturally someone just becomes hooked to it. It's more of a process of, of, well, of being exposed to it. But then deep inside is an instinct where Allah puts between a husband and wife, mawadda and rahmah, love and mercy. And... Uh, and of course, that means sometimes husbands and spouses, of course, they're intimate and that increases their love. So they're in this addiction is quite different, bro. So it's a bit where deep down you have those instincts, proc- you know, pro- uh, procreation and just sort of like 
building family, subhanAllah, the, the continuation of the existence of the human being lies within the nikah. Nikah means, you know, intercourse, technically in, in, in an Arabic way. So, so on a personal level, we're speaking about something that without the human nature would fail to exist. Matter of fact, forget, you know, human life, life form at large, animals. So do you understand the point I'm trying to say where the porn addiction is sure, a bit sure. more, wow. And so 20 years back as well, if you're speaking Faisal, bro, it's not really that exposed. Let's be honest, isn't it? Now it's becoming more of a taboo. It's becoming more in, you know, gadgets, phones. Now it's like, it's becoming something that's just the norm. If you're watching it, do you understand? So obviously this addiction is quite different than your normal addiction that you're exposed to. Do you understand? And it has to be addressed. I remember um, one of the teachers in the masjid, he said that his, his teacher had a smartphone, right? And he saw went like he saw a a picture of a female on a smartphone, and he got rid of his phone. And he went back to like a brick phone. And the teacher who was giving the lecture, he said that he said to his teacher, it gets it gets a bit confusing. He said he said to his teacher, uh, Sheikh, you know how much benefit you could give with this smartphone. And the Sheikh he said, um, as true as that might be, the harms. That I will be getting from the smartphone outweigh uh, the potential good. It's, um, true. it's like a double sided sword, isn't it? Like, you know, that's a minimum. Every household, every Muslim household, right? The m on a minimum level, we should all have restrictions in place in our homes. It's like you have drug dealers, right? You know, in your kids' bedrooms, and there's no barrier between these drug dealers and our kids, right? And uh, something, if I were to just suggest, uh, right, that everyone can do is just go online to your network provider. Everyone has an online account, right? And you can just block all adult content. That's through your network provider's account. And everyone should do this because all the youngsters I deal with, right, all the brothers, they all mention the same patterns. It was a friend introduced it, something popped up on the screen. And subhanAllah, I was having a, a session a couple of days ago and the brother was mentioning anime, right? Uh, and you get a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, youngsters who are into anime and they say all anime websites Apparently, they have pornographic um, pop-ups, right? And he said, what is the reason for these pornographic pop-ups? Because anime is for children, it's for youth, you know, teenagers. Uh, but what you have to understand, you know, we're dealing with a trillion dollar industry, right? They study psychology. They know what they're doing. They want to get you when you're young, right? And they want to get you addicted, right? And, you know, going on even um, online, right? You can see anything and everything. So. And that's why there's all these genres, Right, because they know how the reward, uh, you know, part of the brain works. The dopamine, there's something called tolerance. Right, it's like the heroin addict always chasing his first high, or the person smoking weed, right, always trying to, you know, have, having to smoke more weed to get the same effect. Likewise, the porn addict, they know that you're not going to just be satisfied, satisfied with uh, something soft core. You're going to need something more extreme and more hardcore material. And that's where the trouble starts. I um, oh, speaking on that topic of, of of adverts and stuff. We actually had this discussion in the office. I think two days ago, and what we were saying is how why is it? Or we were breaking down why um, you get like the most um, like ludicrous adverts on websites where you can like, for example, download YouTube videos, right? Mm. And downloading YouTube videos generally. Anyone in any field like may come across, especially with how mm -hmm. how common YouTube videos are now. So, um, I was downloading a YouTube video, and um, in fact, I think it was like an Islamic lecture, right, for like an Instagram edit or something. It might have even been one of ours. And I uh, and I said to, to Nate in the office, I said, "How crazy is it that it's like these type of websites where you're like downloading a video and stuff that like they all these pop ups are everywhere, right?" And then we started like breaking down the, con the 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 demographic and the psychology, the consumer psychology behind it. And we we came to terms with the fact that you know perhaps generally the type of person that's like streaming online, downloading YouTube videos um, for like and like it's very like kind of like technical things like the the, the 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 general person probably doesn't see any benefit in that but if you're downloading youtube video you're probably planning to edit it or do something with it which means you're quite technical which might mean that your demographic or like you you as a person are the type of person who stays in your computer a bit um it's quite technical is like and so they've built this profile of this person uh, based on the fact that they're downloading a YouTube video, and so that's why those perhaps we are guessing here, perhaps that's why they're targeting those advert uh, those websites. And then um, it made me realize a second realization 
that there's these apps right you can download like a premium app that costs money maybe let's say 20 quid i think i think the one that i'm thinking of um i, I believe is at 25 pounds and it's a one-time purchase and it's a premium um app that allows you to download youtube videos on your it's a software on your mac that because it's a premium software you don't have to pay uh, so you don't see any adverts it's downloaded mm -hmm. on your mac right and it made me realize that you know what if you were to spend that 25 pounds with the intention that you don't want to see those pop-ups, like you're spending that for Allah's sake, right? Allah. Would you really, would you lose that money? I, I'm asking you like, that's a, that's a, that's expenditure for Allah's sake. Am I right or am I wrong, yeah, Stan? You're right, you're right. I mean, you know, subhanAllah, there's like a common theme that's, that's been going around. When it comes to, you know, investing in things which are ukhrawi, to do with the akhirah, we, we always want a cheap offer. We always want a, you know, something that's, you know, madrasa. I know parents that go to madrasa, they complain well, about the price is too high. When it comes to, so say, for example, let's say, you know, that maths or that English or that whole year tuition fee for this particular subject, or not even that, just say, for example, just extra, you know, creation activities just to keep the children engaged. They'll spend, you know, thousands and thousands. But when it comes to saving one's religion, there has to be a concept or just, just the, the moral within oneself, the norm, the values that you appreciate as a human being, the natural way that Allah created you, that you have some sense of hayat, some sense of shyness. These things as well, character means a lot. You know, the Prophet, peace be upon him, he told us there's nothing more heavy on the scales on the day of judgment than good mannerisms, good conduct. So in you, you know, spending that 25 pound, be it to you a lot, be it maybe a little, whether you can't afford it or not. But if it safeguards, you know, uh, your inside, your heart, wallahi, then that, you can't put a price to that, bro. It's priceless. Wallahi, you can't put a price to that. Because Allah says, on a day where no children, all wealth will be of avail, except for the one who comes to Allah with a clean heart. Clean heart. That's why when it comes to real matters that involve tezkiyah, that involve purifi purification of oneself, when it involves, you know, you being at home with Allah, you know, you being, you know, one with Allah in a sense where you understand, He understands you, you understand Him, and you're being open and you understand I have these weaknesses, you know, I'm this, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got shortcomings like everyone else does, every human being does, that is the norm of the human beings. But then at the same time, you show Allah you're trying, you know, I'm trying to invest. You're being sincere deep down in your heart, isn't it? And that's what really, that now coming to that point as well, just going back to it, we need to spend money on these things, of course, especially when we have children growing up, you know, you know, you've got Zakaria, I've got Leif, you know, I've got my daughter as well, you know, when they're growing up, of course, I would, I would spend thousands, you know, millions if I had it, you know, to, to secure, you know, their fitrah, you know, how they are naturally. I don't want my child to be exposed to things maybe, you know, that the youth were exposed to, you know, that weren't in a good environment or the fact that I can feel that I don't need to, there's no boundaries between me and my friend, whether it be male or female, and that I can just show them whatever. Of course not, I wouldn't want that. I mean, naturally, you want to look after your kids. You want to care for them. You want to m make sure that they don't fall in the same errors or mistakes that you fell in. Whether it means you spend that 25 pounds, wallahi, to us it may be a lot, but deep down, the ripple effects, as we were mentioning, no one knows those ripple effects and the causes of that sadaqah, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-alim, the all-knowing, al-basir, the all-seeing. And he knows what harms we prevented our children or ourselves from seeing. So, of course, bro, like, we need to spend money on these things and we e need to value it. Even uh, as you were saying that and you're, you know, I suppose that the thing currently we're talking about is ads, right? And sometimes you look at things like, for example, YouTube offer this YouTube premium, which costs £11.99 a month, which is quite absurdly overpriced, right? Mm -hmm. But you get no ads. And so perhaps... I don't know if, if we're talking about the ideal, just removing the chances, because it seems like it's almost a game of like probability. Like the, the probability is, is that you are going to need to use a service like YouTube mm. in your life. Right. Um, it's hard to completely remove something that's so powerful that mm -hmm. can help so much in so many different ways. Um, but then if they're offering this thing for £11.99 a month, like you're saying, perhaps it's just worth investing that because at £11.99, I suppose once you regret that sin, that feeling of regret, if you said to yourself, wow, if only I just paid that 11.99, I would pay 11.99 not to feel this guilty right now. Yeah. Right? 
Because look at the longer term effects, right? And it's interesting you say that because even like uh, on free movie websites, for instance, you yeah. see these pop ups. And majority, w- what will be the main crowd going towards these websites is the youth, right? Who can't maybe afford Netflix or something premium, uh, you know, memberships. And uh, why it is, we have to realize that, you know, these industries s- spend millions, if not billions, right, on what they're doing, right, to get people addicted and so on. Um, and likewise, you know, on for for us to uh, you know uh, protect the youth is very important because what's happening is you know if i was to tell you statistics that people i deal with older people tend to recover uh, much quicker right the people who are being divorced uh, you know or the married brothers why is that because they got m- a lot more at stake right they felt the destruction of this problem in their lives right and i think another aspect which uh, you know we're talking about is the fact that their brains haven't been hardwired to pornography Right, like what Sad was saying, pornography wasn't the way it was 20 years ago, right? And then after that, I would say the brothers are getting married. They take it a bit more seriously. Again, there's that age gap. They're a bit older. The youth struggle a lot. Alhamdulillah, we know that the brain can rewire itself, right? We can uh, even, you know, rewire our relationship with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and we'll talk about that later because that's what is the, is the main solution to this issue, right? Um, but essentially, what's going on is these youngsters struggle. Alhamdulillah, I've seen even youngsters, uh, you know, recover. And recovery is not like they can just learn something for a month or two and they sort of know recovery is for life, right? Because it's a deeper underlying issue. So what's happening with these youngsters, why they struggle so much? Because imagine, like Usad was mentioning, this is something God-given, something natural, something beautiful for us to procreate, right? And Allah's built these chemicals in our brains, such as dopamine, right? Serotonin, endorphins, whatever. And that is for us to bond with our spouses, Right? When we have intimacy, when we're intimate with our spouses, every time we're intimate, that bond uh, uh, you know, gets stronger. What's happening w- with these uh, individuals who are watching pornography, they are essentially bond- bonding with pixels. Right? So every time they are watching pornography, right, they are uh, you know, climaxing, acting out, whatever it may be, right? the bond is getting stronger to pornography. So, and then they're going into marriage, and you know, the, the wife cannot match these pixels, or it's not even that, it's just the fact that the brain uh, has been, you know, all these addictive, wi- uh, addictive wiring has been created over years, decades. Oh. I have brothers in their 40s, right? So there are going to be problems going into marriage, you know, especially uh, your married brother, I'm mar- we're all married here, right? First year of marriage is like a roller coaster. So there might be problems with intimacy, and then if we were to go further, the other problems, Okay, they may not, you know, you may be all right with intimacy, right, which is, uh, uh, which will be problematic, but it's all the other mental health issues that you've developed, right, with the pornography addiction, right, the mood swings, how are you going to deal with the arguments with your wife, how are you going to deal with, uh, with your wife's pregnancy, and these things I'm mentioning, they're also common um, reasons for relapse, when people report to me they've relapsed, married brothers, it was uh, when their wife was pregnant, it was after the newborn, Right, so they've been sober for six months, year, doing good, but they're not dealing with the deeper issues. Right, this is just, it's like an iceberg. Right, you know, above the water, you see the the tip. Right, there's the porn, the the masturbation, uh, escorts, drugs, alcohol, whatever it may be. Right, but that's the visible. Right, that's at a conscious level. The problem is underneath the waters, the much larger part, and that's what needs to be taken care of. And what does that tend to be? Those are underlying causes and conditions, right? And those are more on the subconscious level. So it could be a various, uh, various different things, right? Mental health compl- implications, um, including, you know, it could, it could vary, right? Trauma. Trauma, anxiety, depression, um, unhealed wounds, you know, negative thinking patterns, behavioral patterns, core beliefs we've developed as children, right? Then the messaging, the negative messaging may have been given to us from our parents, Right? Quite innocently, this may have taken place from our teachers. Right? So, for instance, like one brother, uh, he said he was forced to work at a takeaway by his parents. And they, they were, it was coming from a good place. Uh, he was about 13. And they wanted to just teach him the value of money. But he goes, he was abused in that takeaway over years. There was so much negative messaging. You're not going to amount to anything. You're a failure. Uh, you're, you know, all this negative messaging. And this cr- creates conditioning. Right? You know, that will go on with you in life, right? When you grow up, when you become an adult and through coaching, I realize that he's holding on to some of these things and that's why he was struggling to recover, uh, you know, traumas. 
I, I, I suppose this comes down to my like naivety and especially as someone who studied psychology uh, at university uh, within, my de- within my degree. So I studied like a very a certain p- a, a part of it, which was social psychology, um, which deals with stuff like mood swings, anger, um, people's brains being wired. But I've always struggled with this idea of someone having a past trauma that is unrelatable mm. and then us connecting that to the um final outcome which is for example an addiction to pornography right um because i imagine there might be people listening who say oh i have the problem that you guys are talking about but i have zero trauma that i can pick up on so Mm -hmm. i suppose what my question is is um is that always the case or is it is it like a is it like a subjective like each case is just completely different and you have to at my test you're having a conversation you're trying to figure it out is there sometimes no underlying issue in terms of trauma and really it's just i suppose being having become addicted because of temptation and because of like we were saying the fitter and stuff maybe if i could touch on it and Faisal can add i mean generally when someone goes through trauma or through hardships remember that's a, that, that's a grief that's a, that's a burden on their shoulders now everyone looks for a way out now that way out is pleasure let's just, let's be honest it's always that way mm. where i can take those mm. that boulder off my shoulders so some people resort to you know what i'm gonna go to the pub you know what i'm gonna go out I'm going to go to, you know what, you know what, I'm going to go cinemas. But the reality is, is that, and, and this, is, this, is a, this, is a, this is a, this is a truthful reality is that because this problem hasn't been mentioned a lot and it is widespread. And the reality is from an Islamic narrative, we have to address these things because they're going to affect our children and they'll affect, you know, other generations to come. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu says, whoever sees from amongst you an evil, then let him try and change it with his hands. And if he can't, then with his tongue. Then if he can't, then the least he should do is hate it in his heart. And that is the weakest of Iman. So for a society to flourish, we have to address these issues. Now, because it's such a thing where it's done privately, it's done secretly, no one really wants to bring it up. So as you're saying, bro, when someone falls in right into that, or they're thinking of the trauma, they're going through those you know, flashbacks of what they've been through, that moment of pleasure or looking at certain images, or as you were saying, you know, some people resort into masturbation, that is their way out for them, for some mm-hmm. people. It might, as I said, I've given alternatives to what some people do. Okay. And for them, yeah. obviously there's that sense of regret after, but they're not thinking about that. As you said, the chemicals running in the brain, for them at the moment, it's just their, their lust, their desire. They're trying to get away from a nightmare that they experienced when they were young. Or they're trying to get away from the trauma that they experienced through a relative. So what they're trying to do now is, they can't hold that. They can't carry that alone, Faisal. You know, it's, it's, it's mountains. You know, in a way where, not physically, but, you know, mentally, psychologically, it's boulders. And what do they do? They know that I can't reach out to so-and-so. I can't really mention this problem to so-and-so. It's shameful. We're saying that, yes, alhamdulillah, but we help each other. You know, you know how many times Faisal may be when moving your house, might call your close brothers or maybe your brother needs a hand or maybe when I need a hand I might reach out to Faisal we're saying that we're in it together and we need to tackle this and the way that some people as I was saying going back to that point that's their way out for them that's their in the mal usri yusra remember Allah says after hardship there comes ease so for some people their hardship their ease for that hardship is their, is their addiction let's be honest bro or their getaway or their escape route or that uh, as you mentioned that escape you know, where they feel that pleasure and unfortunately is a reality that is spreading and spreading like wildfire, tr- you know, trillion, multi-trillion dollar organization, you know, infested within our homes. Mothers, parents don't know the reality of what their children's going through. I remember, you know, children's because I, I, I reach out to the youth. Mothers, they're thinking that their children are going to school and they are going to school, but maybe there's an odd friend there. And this friend, maybe the levels weren't set with him in his tarbiyah and his upbringing. So he might just bring out a phone, show something, not just to a brother or, or to a boy or to a male, but to a female as well. And those marks, they leave detrimental marks in the future. They change someone's life pattern. They make someone jobless. They make someone depressed. They make someone fall into anxiety. They even make people commit suicide. So let's not try and put the thing behind our back. Let's say, look, the Ummah, Muslims are struggling. You know, I read an article. I read an article, it was in the Times or something where, you know, some of the top countries that are exposed to this and, and follow, you know, these porn- pornographic websites are Muslim countries. In the top five, you're speaking at least, you know, two of them. 
you know, obviously America is that, that sense of, you know, general liberty, freedom is exposed there here in the UK as well. But we're speaking about other Muslim countries that, you know, where marriage is hard. You know, for you to get married, you need to have a house. You need to have this much money. You know, you can't marry my daughter unless you got this. Or who's this guy? He's not, he doesn't have a degree. He's not raising this. And what happens? Our community resort to what? You know what? Allah created this within me. I have a natural, you know, instinct. Mm -hmm. I have a natural instinct. I have a natural way that I'm going to deal with this. They fall into the trap, bro. No. And that's why we have to help them. Unfortunately, what is, bro, everyone has their own journey. Everyone's different. So I deal with brothers who have unresolved issues with their father. Only by, you know, going through it with someone. It's like you need a mirror sometimes, right? And um, then you find out the deeper underlying issues. And some, some people may have, uh, you know, one brother may have, issues with his uh, father another brother will have issues about fantasies right just you know um, wanting to be something wanting to be someone famous so on and another brother a friend I'll give you an example of trauma so some brothers report se you know sexual abuse physical abuse and there's one brother I dealt with he was um, you know part of gangs and so on so he lived that lifestyle involving drugs zina drug dealing whatever it may be right but alhamdulillah Allah guided him right and Allah is the controller of hearts Right? Allah is the one who guides right? um, So he came on deen and he felt that sweetness of iman And he was sober for a year right? So he told me he was sober for a year from everything Even pornography But what happened in that period right, After a year he relapsed with pornography He watched pornography And then it became a problem After you know, a couple of months, years And I asked him what was going on in that year When you started practicing Islam And he said you know, I left my previous lifestyle And I had this beautiful relationship with Allah Right? I knew Allah's got me No matter what problems or trials I was facing I could walk the streets fearless And you know just uh, You'll mention verses of the Quran Like no one can harm No one can benefit other than Allah Right? Everything is decreed Right? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, And that's why You know he was, he was developing that relationship He was nurturing it And what happened after a year He got back into work and so on Life stresses came back Right? So he relapsed And then after going through some sessions with him I realized that you know, his old conditioning was coming back. I would ask him questions about his thought, thought patterns. Is uh, you know, uh, what is he feeling? And he said, I, I would think that I'm going to see someone from my past and get into a situation. He'll start oh. interpreting. So he's been through you know some difficult situations, life-threatening situations, obviously because he was involved in gangs, violence. Um, so he would start interpreting that in, into his working life, into his family life, and that's how the conditioning it will sometimes switch itself up. And what are we talking about here? Ultimately, we're talking about our qareen. And we can give it different names, the inner addict, last one we're dealing with this addiction. Um, and the qareen, you know, it will switch forms, right? Uh, before, it was a problem where he was going and he was escaping his uh, whatever traumas he was suffering from. He was escaping it through drugs, alcohol, and, and then he found the real solution, right? That God hole that he was trying to fill with drugs, with alcohol, with zina. He found the real solution. And that's where Allah SWT tells us in the Quran Allah That verily in the remembrance of Allah Do hearts find tranquility So he started practicing And he found the real solution To all his problems But what happened? He didn't nurture that relationship It worked for him uh, You know, Again what he was doing in early uh, practicing years He was in a masjid a lot Attending lectures around good company And that was helping him To nurture and develop that relationship and that's what even the Prophet ﷺ told us, right? He said, make this dua, Ya muqallib al qulub sabit qulubana ala deenik. That, O oh, controller of hearts, keep our hearts firm on your deen, on your way. So this is another uh, aspect to the, the problems that drive people to escapism. Alhamdulillah, this brother is sober for probably over about three years now, two, three years. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. Because he's renewed that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that trust and tawakkal in him. So, um... I remember, you know, we hear a lot that kind of when you're, I remember uh, Ustad Muhammad Tim Humble, he said that, um, you know, this, I, I mean, I mean, such an amazing individual. You know this ayah about um, the, uh, the believers being brothers. Um, and he said that there's a common tafsir of this ayah that there is no true um, brotherhood without iman. Yeah, he said this is a common tafsir of the ayah. There's, that there's no true brotherhood 
um, without Iman. But he said there's another tafsir of that ayah that doesn't contradict that tafsir. And he said we can take both. And he said that what the other tafsir of the ayah is, is that there is no true Iman without brotherhood. And it really impacted me that because it, it makes you think about the times when your Iman feels the highest and therefore you feel the strongest against sins is when you're with brothers who remind you of Allah, right? Mm. And so it made me realize that, you know, we, we, we hear about the person who, you know, would um, worship Allah alone, um, uh, but, the, but in the benefit of the person who can like benefit others and worship Allah in, uh, And it, that's why there's so many things that we do together as a Jama'at mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I found it really impactful So uh, it, it, within your guys' um, counselling sessions Do you bring that up? Do you bring up like being around brothers? Like where, what's your formula? Because there's all of these different vices Like talking about trauma, being around the brothers um, uh, Having a better connection with Allah Changing your thought patterns Like this is, it's like a massive cloud of so many different ways we can combat this Where's the start and how do you kind of like How do you even train yourselves and your other counsellors to, to be able to pick out which solution is right for that individual person? So this, that's why structure is very important because addiction is all about procrastination, laziness, and so on. And the thing is, with this addiction, um, it's interesting. I was talking to Isad uh, uh, Yusuf about it. That um, it's a bit like Rukia, right? You know, you have that experience of dealing with people with this problem. And I remember a family member going to a Raqi, and the Raqi is a very experienced Raqi. First thing he asked uh, this family member of mine is that, "Did you want to come here?" Right, how did you feel on the way here? The family member was like, I don't want to come here. I was doing my best not to come. And I mentioned this to a few brothers, and they said, we feel the same way before we get onto the calls with you. We don't want to attend uh, the sessions. And I said, that's not you who doesn't want to attend the sessions. That's the inner addict mm. that doesn't want to attend the sessions because he knows that, you know what, you're in a community, you're around people with direct experience and knowledge of this, and they're going to direct you towards Allah. But the inner addict wants to call you towards uh, you know, the other way. And uh, that's why structure is very important. Discipline is very important. And we've kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, put it into a program, you know, eight stages, where we direct everyone. You know, there's worksheets, there's a course, uh, books, and we tell every step of the way, we'll tell people what to do. Uh, you know, there's a few things. If I were to just give some examples, and again, this will seem random because I'm just saying it from the top of my mind. And in the course, it's structured, you know, because someone will have to go through a specific program, right, in a, in a certain way. And um, starting off, right, it's not a solo journey. You need that recovery community, like you mentioned. It's, it's not something that can be done alone. It's not something that you can just read. Because a lot of brothers come to me and say, for years we've been uh, you know, doing self-help stuff, research, uh, work, and uh, trying to combat this on our own. No, it's, 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 it has to be done in a jama, in, uh, you know, in a community. So that's essential. Because you'll forget, with addiction, a person will be sober for a week, and then they'll say, you know, I'm cured. Right? And the reality is, you know, we don't want to deal with our demons, right? the inner demons. Right? People want to forget about it. No one wants to be saying, I'm a porn addict, I was a drug addict, right? I was an alcoholic. Right? So um, that's the only solution. You have to be in recovery, in a co recovery community for life. And this may seem burdensome, but subhanAllah, there's certain brothers that tell me it's the best thing that's ever happened to them. Because wow. certain brothers are saying that we found a new relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It, it was something that brought us closer to Allah, right? If it wasn't for this, this wouldn't have happened. So it's more than just getting sober from, uh, you know, the drug, right? It's about happiness. It's about comfort, you know, tranquility, peace. It's about being, saving your marriage, right? It's about being a better husband, a better father. Are the calls anonymous? You said that they're yeah. the calls. Yeah, yeah, totally anonymous. So the per Everything. so. How does that work? How, how, do you, how are you able to manage that? So, um, we obviously, I will know who the person is, Fine. isn't it? And, you know, it's Amana. Okay, we can only be so anonymous. But, you know, we do, everyone, you come in, you can have your own nickname, uh, you know, be part of the program, the forums, and then we try to assign accountability partners. And everyone, uh, you know, who has this problem has to remember that you're only going to deal with people who have the same problem. Mm -hmm. Right, so everyone you're dealing with, your accountability partner, who you're gonna uh, go through the program, right? They can totally relate, and you know, it's it's um, we try our best actually to keep it as anonymous sure. as we can. That's amazing. And you guys are obviously mentioned this a lot, like the, so far in this in this podcast, we've spoken kind of. It seems that like we're speaking through uh, the male perspective. Um, is is you guys only 
um, council males? Is it a problem that seems to exist more so in males? It sh appears as if it's more for male problem. Again, we were talking about this. Um, I think it's a big problem with females. We get a lot of sisters contacting us. The statistics as well, uh, very high statistics of women uh, admitting is something like 43% of women in America admitting that, you know, they have, uh, uh, you know, uh, some kind of, they've seen pornography, you have some kind of problem with pornography. Uh, so do we do get sisters approaching us and we have some sister coaches, as well, alhamdulillah, but uh, it's much harder for them, isn't it? Imagine it's hard enough for a Muslim male to come and expose this problem. Uh, and imagine how hard it will be for, for a sister. E even on that point as well, subhanAllah, when we're speaking about, you know, generally society has, um, brings about certain norms, certain, you know, principles maybe that people adopt. And sometimes, unfortunately, society today is like, if a man does something, if he commits zina, then it's okay. When it's not. Or, but if a sister does it, or, you know, a woman does it, it's a bit more looked down upon. So now when we're speaking about pornography related to, you know, girls, Muslim females, it's a big issue as well, but it's more shameful that the, the way the society has, has put it at the moment, it's more shameful for a woman to bring out her secrets or to bring out her addiction on a platform and then to address it when really, bro, the problem is rife in both for the males and the females, Muslim, you know, uh, males and females. It's just the males, maybe there's a, as you said, bro, there's like a tap or there's something at the moment where it's more accepted if a man comes out with that rather than a sister. When really, no, it's, you know, they're both wrong and they both need help. And that's why, you know, the platform is providing, you know, Alhamdulillah, my Tezkiah, you know, f uh, female coaches as well. So, and even on the point you were mentioning, brother Faisal, about, you know, as an Ummah, we have to address this issue. You know, even Allah says in the Quran, um, you know, الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ that the non-Muslims, they are, they are supporters of one another. They are allies of one another. They have, you know, goals, ambitions which they support. And oh, you Muslims, if you don't become one and become as a community, what does Allah say? There'll be great corruption and there'll be uh, uh, trials and tribulations on the earth and great corruption, subhanAllah. Not even that Allah says, subhanAllah, Allah says, يعني, Allah says, obey Allah and His Messenger. Yani all of you as a community. Allah's not saying you as an individual. Yani, and don't, you know, uh, defer from each other. Don't hate one another. Otherwise, you'll lose courage. Your bond will break down. Then Allah says, be patient with one, one another. You've got problems. He's got problems. She's got problems. Be patient with one another. Doesn't mean you put the, the problem behind your back. It means no. Address those problems. Like Umar al Khattab, he would say, Rahim Allah, Mra'an, ahda ilayya ayyubi. May Allah have mercy on the person who, who gives to me my faults. This is real brotherhood, real sisterhood. Sister, you're going through this problem. Brother, you're going through this problem. Let me help you. Not someone that just shoves it behind their shoulders or doesn't address it in front of your face. No, that's real, you know, brotherhood. Matter of fact, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, you know, thalathun. Three things, whatever they're in, someone who tastes the halal of Iman. One of them, he loves someone for the sake of Allah, doesn't love him for any other reason. Yani that brotherhood, that bond shit, important. And what does that mean? It means, as Imam al we said, yani, when in the hadith, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه That none of you will truly believe until he loves for his brother, i.e. his sister, what he loves for himself. What does it mean? It means that. That, yani, you hate harm for yourself, you hate the same harm for your brother and sister. What you want for yourself, you want for your brother and sister. Yani, anything, on any superficial level, that car, you want it for yourself, for example, or that, you know, that dars, or that particular book, or that, you know, that knowledge that you've learned, you want to give that back. And that's real brotherhood. Remember, we can't tackle these issues, at, at, you know, like, oh, it's just me. No, bro. Shaitan has got experience with our grandparents and our ancestors. He knows what runs through our blood. He knows what, oh yeah, I, must, I know your ancestors very well. I know how it spikes here. I know, you know, what's going to work well with you. The only way we're countering things, bro, because remember Muhammad said that the wolf comes after the strain, you know, sheep, the one that's alone. It's going to come after you. Sister, you're dealing with this alone. Brother, you're dealing with this alone. He's coming. He's coming. And the only way that that wolf, that shaitan, doesn't come is when he sees a strong jama'ah. Yeah, I see my sisters. I see my brothers. They, they got my back. They're ready. They're dealing with the problems with me. And that's why we're saying as a community, 
We need to deal with this. You know, and there needs to be organizations like my, my Tezkiah. You know, other, other, you know, other religions are dealing with this. The Jewish community are dealing with this. They're spending millions of pounds. You know, millions. Christian community dealing with this. Atheist community dealing with addictions. You know, even including pornography. Where is the Ummah? I mean, uh, this is Fahisha. This is Munkar. Let's put la 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 ever then. Mm -hmm. To deal with the good, to enjoy in the good and forbid the evil. You see a problem, you deal with the root. You come to the crux of the matter. You don't, as I said, put it behind your back. La, Muhammad mm -hmm. said them. You know, he said that uh, on occasion he woke up and he said a hole like this was put in in, in the barrier between Yajuj and Majuj. The Sahaba said, Yani, would they come out whilst there's you know people amongst us, good people, righteous people? You know what Muhammad said? He said, yeah, إذا فس, إذا, إذا الفساد, يعني فساد, When the corruption increases, i.e. when everyone's just chilling back, oh, yeah, they're doing evil. Yeah, let me just join it. Oh, it's the norm. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's calm. Leave it as it is. La, that's when evil spreads. And that's why, bro, you know, I don't want to go too long with these things because I know it's, it's somewhat of a conversation. I don't want to bore anyone. But if we look at verses of Quran, like Allah speaks about a nation. That there were three groups of people. Why are you advising the people that Allah is going to destroy or punish them severely because of the wrong that they're doing? This group says we're doing it as an obligation to our Lord and so that they may fear Allah. What does it mean, bro? There's three groups of people. Let's understand this. There's those who are bystanders. They're not in the evil. They're not doing the action. They don't have a porn addiction. They don't have any addiction. They don't have nothing. But they're just like... Chilling, I'm going to sit back, it's not my show. There's the second group that are in, in their addiction. They're, say for example, they're in the sin. They're drowning in it. And there's a third group that is what? Enjoying the good, forbidding the evil. They're saying, you know what? We're, we're advising them. The second group that's not doing the sin, bro. Those that are just sitting back and saying, why are you advising them? Allah's going to destroy them. They're sinful people. You know what they say? No, they're from us. They're our community. They're suffering. We're suffering too. It's going to affect our children. It's going to affect our family. You know what? I'm doing this for the sake of Allah Because enjoying the good and forbidding the evil Is a key factor for the flourishment of a society Wallahi, wallahi this, this is a principle As a matter of fact, Muhammad said He said that there will come a time Where the best of you The ulama of you Will make dua and Allah won't answer their dua Because of, not, because of you not enjoying the good and forbidding the evil SubhanAllah So what happens bro, these three groups of people Allah says in a, in a verse فَلَمَّا عَتَوْ عَمَّا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ and Allah says that uh, when they forgot what they were reminded to do, Allah says that we saved those who forbid the evil. So Allah and we destroyed the others. The scholars say who were destroyed? The sinners and the bystanders. Those that weren't in the sin themselves. Those that were just chilling, seeing the evil spreading. Uh, my household's cool. My daughter, my son's fine. It's perfect. I'm okay. These two groups were destroyed. The only one that was saved were those that enjoined in the good and forbidden the evil. That's why, bro, and I honestly agree today, bro, because there's, you know, we hear these verses in Quran, in Surah Kaf, and Quran is the asl for us. We always come back to it. Allah says, yani, they were, we know the story of the boys that Allah saved their wealth in Surah Kaf. Why? Because their father was righteous. Allah saved that. But let me tell you now something. Now, it's not sufficient enough just for the father or the mother to be righteous. These are not my words. These are not my words. Allah said this in Quran. Why? Shall I tell you why? Because of this verse in Quran. Now, you want your son to be righteous. You want your son to be upright. You want your daughter to be on point. You take them with you to activities. You get them involved. You empower them. You, you, know, you, 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 you build the courage within them. You take them on real life experiences. You don't just leave them at home with an iPad. You don't just leave them at home with a, with a gadget and let the, let the world educate them. No, you be an active father. You be an active mother. Do you understand? So that's why what I'm trying to say is, Allah will destroy a nation if there's righteous people amongst them. Allah will destroy a nation. But Allah won't destroy a nation if there's muslihin amongst them, rectifiers. Allah says this in Quran. And Allah would not destroy a nation whilst its people are rectifiers. People that enjoy in the good forbid the evil. But Allah will destroy a nation if there's righteous people amongst them. We know this famous story you know, of the angel Jibra'il. Uh, Athar from the Muslim angel Jibra'il You know Allah commands the angel to destroy a city The angel comes and sees that there's an habit there There's a worshipper of Allah He worships you day and night But evil is spread around the community What does, Allah, yani, what does the Athar say? Start with him and take him to Jahannam first Why? Because bro Islam is not for me and you It's not my, my personal thing 
Rahmatan lil alameen. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa came as a mercy to mankind. He didn't come so that you can feel that iman in your heart and just kick back and relax. No, he came so that every single human being, every animal, every creature, every creation sees the mercy of Islam and the Muslims. Wallahi. And that's why this individual was the one that Allah commanded the angel to start with him taking him to the hellfire. So what am I saying, bro? I'm saying, let's be honest. We have to be real. We have to address this issue and, and many other issues. It's time that as a Muslim community, we deal with our problems face on. Let's say, for example, the ceiling's leaking. There's no point you know, wiping the floor. Let's deal with the root of the matter. Let's go yeah. and fix the leak itself. That's what we're saying. And that's why we're saying we're bringing this problem to light. We're making it, you know, loud because, bro, our sisters are struggling. Our brothers are struggling. Humanity is struggling. Let's not just speak about the Muslims. Mm -hmm. Non-Muslims are struggling. Hey, bro, as we've mentioned, jobless, divorces, uh, suicide. Mm -hmm. Until when, bro? Until when, Faisal? Do you understand? That's why these issues, they have to be addressed, bro. And that's why as a community, we're not together. Bro, forget minor issues. You know, you're praying your hand here, here, there. Akhi, wallahi, apostasy. Apostasy in a teenage age is around 23%, bro. You know what that means? It means that when you send your son and your daughter to school, if you're not an active father or an active mother, what does that mean? It means that if you're not up to date and you're not having you know, an active relationship with your children, thoughts, and concepts are being exposed to your children, whether they be scientific, whether they be, you know, a particular way of life. If you don't have that relationship and, and teach your son and your daughter how to deal with that, rather than to be lazy and then to shove it in the back of their mind. So then, so then a, a concept or, an, or, or a thought becomes an idea and an idea becomes a concept and a concept becomes an ideology and then it becomes a way of life and they're destroyed now. Deal with the matter. Deal with the matter before it's too late. And that's why we're saying, may Allah bless you and everyone that we have to address issues like this and many more. If a person's coming to my Tazkia to, to try and fix this issue, they've noticed that they have a have kind of a problem within and uh, they want to address it. We can assume that that person perhaps is a person who is conscious of Allah because they want to actually address the issue, right? Yeah. And so earlier we were mentioning the fact that, you know, these um, actions and addictions can have negative consequences on your marriage, uh, on your job and stuff like that. But do you find that it's quite beneficial because of the type of person that's coming to you? The type of person is someone who is conscious of Allah. Do you find that uh, uh, perhaps a another way of deterring them from this addiction is by speaking less of like the impact on your marriage, but the consequences that um, that it relates to in our religion? Like, for example, the possibility of risk being taken away, the possibility of your iman uh, decreasing, the possibility of um, sins not being forgiven. Uh, 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 and you guys know better than me what, what what consequences we have But do you guys find that as an effective technique That perhaps putting the realistic fear um, Using evidences Is quite helpful Because of the types of people that are coming to you You can incorporate it Right but You see the addiction is such a thing that it will bypass all of that mm. okay. Right when the addict wants to act out When the brain wants a drug It will access his drug That's why filters are a big part of recovery but filters are not the solution. And just to speak on that, um, about sisters, you were saying, I just want to do mention that you know we try to make it as comfortable as possible for anyone to come and join. And the person who is uh, hesitant to join, you just have to weigh the odds, right? Is you staying in isolation more important than your marriage? Is it more important than your kids? Right? Is it more important? I've known people who have committed suicide because of sex addiction, right? Is it more important than your iman, your deen, your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right, so that's what you have to, um, you know, compare. Because if someone had a drug problem, they would go to the doctor. They would may go to a rehabilitation center. Their family will take them to the rehabilitation center and pay thousands of pounds to get recovery. Likewise, someone with alcohol problem. And scientists correlate pornography with heroin. They, they've done tests, uh, brain scans, and they've seen similar effects taking place of someone who's watching pornography and someone who's shooting heroin into their veins. Subhanallah. And to mention. Right, you asked about the, the effects. I just wanted to mention some statistics, right? Um, if that's all right. Yeah, Basically, of course. the financial cost to business productivity in the US alone is estimated at 16.9 billion annually. It's all to do with pornography addiction. 
According to National Coalition for the Protection of Children and Families, 2010 this report was, 47% of families in the United States reported that porn is a problem in their homes. Pornography use increases the marital infidelity rate by more than 300%. So you're more than three times likely to cheat on your spouse if you're watching pornography for, or if you have a pornography addiction. 40% of people identified as sex addicts lose their spouses. 58% suffer considerable financial losses, as you mentioned about risk, subhanAllah, uh, and about 33% lose their jobs. 68% of divorce cases involve one party meeting a new paramour, uh, meaning someone that they uh, have an illicit relationship with, over the internet, while 56% involve one party having an obsessive interest in pornographic materials. And just two days ago, uh, one of the brothers, uh, one of the members actually sent a, um, a tweet, right? And a sister was mentioning her story, subhanAllah, and she said that she found out, you know, it starts off with porn. It seems to every, every uh, you know, thing that continues, right? I, I've got brothers I'm working with that are smoking weed, and they said they kind of got into weed to escape this problem, subhanAllah. And her brother started smoking cigarettes to escape this. Brothers who ended up going to clubs, alcohol, whatever it may be. So this sister mentioned the same story. It always is this common theme. She found pornography. So he, uh, you know, she found out about it, mentioned it to his family, and uh, got him into some kind of counselling. And she was over the moon, alhamdulillah. Okay, he had a problem. He's, you know, he's doing the right thing, right? Because no one will look down. People may look down on you for your addiction, but no one will look down on you for recovery, right? You're recovering from this. You're reaching out to Allah. What happened, while he was getting a counselling, she didn't know he was still visiting escorts, right? So he wasn't, you know, recovering uh, properly for some reason. Um, and then he admitted to it, because what happened, she found out she co uh, contracted an STD, sexually tra transmitted disease. Later on, he opened up and he said he's visited over 100 escorts in that period, right? Uh, and I have brothers, unfortunately, that are committing zina, started off with pornography. Brothers who are visiting escorts, right? Um, and this does tend to happen, but you see, the, even these effects sometimes, I do incorporate that, incorporate that into the sessions. Uh, but like I said, the addiction part of the brain will override that. And then it comes to a few simple things I'll tell you, that it's not about willpower. This is not about, I am going to do this. I am not going to take drugs. I am not going to drink alcohol. I am not going to watch pornography. Because where is that coming from when you say, I am going to do it? That's coming from the ego. Right? So it's never going to solve the problem. In fact, willpower right, comes from the similar parts of the brain which deal with these emotions. Right? So there's this automatic uh, overriding taking place. The solution, actually, what has worked is surrender. As we're given the example, the Quran is a solution. I, I remember um, someone mentioning it the other day, saying every problem of ours, the solution is in the Quran. And the solution to pornography sex addiction is in the Quran. Where? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. He was a prophet from amongst the best of men. Right? What did he do when right. it was Zulaikha? Uh, it was Zulaikha, right? Came to him. He called out to Allah, Ya Allah, protect me. And brothers do this, but they do this after they've gone to the escort, after six months. You know, the, 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 the guilt comes, you know, the shame, and they turn to Allah. And then Allah keeps them sober. Allah saying, I'm going to do my part, fix up, do some recovery work, right? And then they forget Allah, we forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what we Am I right in do, saying that also the Prophet uh, Yusuf, he ran, like where normally Allah. we perhaps, we might not see a way out. But it's almost as if there was no concern about how I'm going to exit. I'm just going to run. And the door, do you know what I mean, open Beautiful. for it. In, in the sense that I remember, um, I don't know who it was, but they were saying um, almost like, uh, and I want to ask you guys about the, oh, sorry, I'm gonna, <laughs> the camera's even on me. I'm going to ask you guys about the uh, practical steps that you guys um, come across that can you advise because you're talking about filters and I want it uh, and I want you to talk about maybe some of the filters that are like the the easy steps like you were saying you gave one example of calling your network provider but um, I remember the speaker he was saying run like Yusuf Islam in a sense that if you recognize places spaces people environments don't go there run run from them whatever it takes so if you notice that when you're at home alone it's peak don't be home alone no matter what there's no go to if you if you if you go if you get if you're working from home and there's no one at home that they go to a coffee shop etc 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 um so on that topic i'll let you finish what you were mentioning but on that topic i really do want to um discuss those practical steps like the one you offered earlier 
like not being at home, like ringing the, um, uh, the network provider and, 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 and others. I'm intrigued. So, Sapala, as you mentioned, right, run. <laughs> one brother messaged on uh, one of the groups we have. Uh, he said, I'm home alone, right? Parents, uh, no one's at home. Sapana. This is the time I relapse. And I don't have the key yeah. to the, the door at home. I said, go outside the door, leave the door slightly open, and don't go back in until your parents come back. Right? If you're serious and committed enough, right, you have to make that willingness. Like you said, Yusuf salam ran, right? Did his bit. So that brings me on to the next part, right? This, so recovery community, surrender. It's not about willpower. And how do we surrender? What is bro, when people come, imagine like an electrical circuit, right? They have this lifestyle. So if we would say that electrical circuit is a lifestyle, it's um, wired in a way to uh, fire up this addiction lifestyle, right? The result is an addiction lifestyle. So what we try to do is cut that electrical circuit and rewire it, interrupt those. You see, the problem isn't acting out like I mentioned, you know, the top of the iceberg, uh, right? That's at the conscious level. Problem is the subconscious, right? So we want to deep dive into the subconscious and bring uh, this out to the conscious and then work on recovery consciously so much so that that rec recovery lifestyle gets embedded into the subconscious. So it becomes second nature. Yeah. So we try to give this, uh, one of the stages is develop a new daily routine. We try to give this lifestyle. So to redirect all those pathways. So before the pathways, this is how the brain will work, right? Stress, so these common uh, triggers, stress, fear, anger, jealousy, pride, that comes, it gets overbearing, and that may come through uh, stress, uh, you know, overload at work, studies, whatever. So what happens is their brain will bring up images, right? Will bring up lust, right? The stuff they've been seeing in pornography, and then they will act out. So we got the, you have to have this new recovery lifestyle, right? So in, as soon as the stress pops up, all right, ultimately you want to deal with the lust, right? So reach out to your accountability partner, reach out to another brother, right? Surrender to Allah. Start off by surrendering to Allah. Start your day with Allah. Every day in the morning, I tell everyone, every day you wake up in the morning, as soon as you open your eyes, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, keep me sober today. I hand over my day to you. You know, this total surrender of your day. Mm. That's and develop this surrender attitude. Like. That's what adkar is like, yeah. Adkar, right? You know, a lot of brothers incorporate adkar, uh, you know, from the sunnah. And um, then what is throughout your day, right? Through every test, every trial, every uh, thing you go through, connect with Allah. Converse with Allah, right? We try to train people to just look. Alhamdulillah, we have salah, right? We pray five times a day and we do converse with Allah. But other than that, right? Just start in your day with Allah, having conversations. Like you mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, He is our wali, right? He's our best friend. The only real friend we will have in this dunya. Our parents may leave us, right? Our spouses may leave us, right? We may get remarried. Our children may leave us. Everything is temporary other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? He will always be with us. So you need to really appreciate this relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, this routine, connecting with Allah. Firstly, connecting with Allah. And not, like I said, after three months, every day, every moment, right? Through every temptation, make this routine so it gets embedded, second nature. And then call out to other members from your recovery network. Read the Matazkiya book, for instance, that we suggest. Uh, right? All these different things. Instead of attend a conference call, watch some you know, YouTube video about tawakkal in Allah, about trust, about hope, mercy. Thirdly, um, or I'm going on to the fourth part, is uh, to uh, so this surrender, this daily routine, and also journaling. We have uh, things that are more intense, right? But to just you know, give a brief overview to someone who's watching, they may not understand uh, the more intense work. So just journal every day. Right? And... You know, as men, you might, you know, I know a lot of uh, mm. females do these things, right? Mm. As men, you'll say, you know, I'm, I'm, this, is, this is some you know, things so. that girls do. But no, it's very important. Every, uh, you know, therapist will tell you journaling is key. Why? Because through journaling, you tap into your subconscious. Mm. Journal every day, a paragraph, right? A sentence, whatever it may be. And then you'll find out what keeps coming up. Mm. What negative Behavioral patterns keep coming up. Mm. What negative thinking keeps coming up, right? And then you, first of all, you recognize the problems that are keep on surfacing. And mm. these are the problems that are driving you to escape because mm. they become unbearable. So through journaling, you start to find out these underlying causes and conditions, right? Mm -hmm. And then what happens 
you can only solve a problem once you know a problem, right? Yeah. You can't solve something you don't even know the problem. Mm. So first of all, you find out about the problem, right? Um, and then you start working towards solutions. So you see something keeps coming up, fears, anxieties, right? You know, uh, this negative, uh, pessimistic attitude towards life. And what is through recovery, what you're doing essentially is just you're, you're changing your perception of life. Okay? You know, instead of seeing the ha- glass as half empty, you see the glass as half full, right? And it's just looking at things from a different angle and being grateful. You know, some of the things into a daily routine. First and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that those who are grateful, He will increase us, right? So even today, psychologists advise it every day in the morning, start off and do a gratitude list. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I recommend everyone in the morning when you wake up, as soon as you open your eyes, connect to Allah, have this relationship with Allah, hand over your day to Allah, and then do a gratitude list. Ya Allah, I'm grateful for the roof. You know, things that we take for granted. Because what happens? Simple things like, you know, grateful for food. I'm grateful for a roof over my head. Ya Allah, I'm grateful for my limbs. Right? The two eyes which, with which I see. Ya Allah, I'm grateful for my hands, my, uh, you know, my legs. And then what happens is, you know, when you develop this attitude of gratitude, you'll be more grateful. Right? And you'll just be a happier person. You'll be at peace and more content and tranquil. And then if you're uh, more peaceful, there'll be less room for escapism. You're gonna, if you're happy, hunky-dory, mm. right? You're not going to want to escape that. It's like one brother um, I'm coaching, he went to um, a holiday recently and for about seven days. And I said, did you get any temptation? And he was in a very liberal place, right? You know, a lot of uh, you know, exposure and so on. And he said, no, I didn't. I said, why? Because I was present. I was enjoying life, right? And all those negative uh, patterns, they weren't there. I was just in the now, connected with Allah. So... You know, it's, it's all about having that, you know, creating that space, safe space for recovery. And then, inshallah, there's less escapism, therefore less relapses, less addiction, more sobriety. And it has that ripple effect. And you build on that on a daily basis, you know, it's one day at a time. I think even from an Islamic perspective, when looking at approaching one's day, there's always a, an important concept of remembering Allah in the morning. You know, from the moment you wake up, you know, not even that, I mean... Um, the famous adhkar that you say in the morning is um, um, Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha la anta khalaqtani wa abduk Oh Allah, you're my Lord There's no one worthy of worship except you You created me, I'm, I'm your servant Wa ana ala ahdika wa wa'dika And I am, you know, upon your covenant And your promise as much as I can fulfill Abu, yeah, bika min sharri ma sanat. I seek refuge in you from the evil that I do Abu laka bi ni'matika alay I acknowledge all of the blessings that you bestowed upon me. Gratefulness. Acknowledge. And I acknowledge my shortcomings, my sins. So forgive me for no one forgives sins except you. It's about being one, you know, yeah. understanding I've got a problem, you know, and I need to address it. Not only that, you know, subhanAllah, you know, we, we, we're speaking about this, you know, even Ibn Taymiyyah, he would say when, when, when his, his students would see him and he would go after Fajr and he would go and do adhkar until the sun rises and he'd be asked, why do you do this? This is my breakfast. And without this, I can't survive. That's what adhkar, you know, build that relationship with Allah. And that's why even when you were saying, bro, you know, it, it stops your rizq, you know, it affects you psychologically, mentally. Let's be honest. Really, you need to be, you know, friends with Allah. You need to have a sidq, man. You need to be true with That's Allah. Open up to Allah. Say, Wallah, I'm struggling. Oh, Wallah, it's hard. Oh, Wallah. And, you know, you build that bond. Allah says, if Allah sees good in your heart, He will give you good. You know, as we were saying, you know, you mentioned the story of Yusuf, alayhi salam. Not only did he say, and he ran to the door, but let's look at that. Let's look at that in, from another perspective. He goes, Rabbi illa tasrif alayhi, yani, yeah, so he says, Oh Allah, if you don't remove their plot away from me, I would feel inclined towards them. The natural, a prophet from the prophet of Allah. Hmm. I'll feel inclined towards them and I'll be from the, 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 the ignorant individuals. Point is, what did he do? As you said, bro, let's look at the ayah properly. Firstly, he acknowledged, he surrendered, bro. Let's look at it from a perspective. Let's do tadabbar on the ayah. Yeah. He surrendered. Rabbi, he said, my Lord, illa tasrif anni kaydahun. If you don't remove from me, yani this fawahish, this munkar, I'm weak. I'm a fool into it. 
Do you understand? Surrender. Not the ego. Yeah, I'm going to deal with this. Head on. No. Alhamdulillah, I've dealt with more than this. Mountains. Mm. Surrender. Now what happens, bro? Let's take it out. So they both ran to the door. What did he do? Yusuf? He didn't just, he made dua and he had the akhadab al asbab. He, he done what he could as well. Tawakkul, true tawakkul. Surrender and do what you have to do. You know, subhanallah, wa ghallaqatil abwab. The ulama say that the doors were locked. Not just a simple lock, locked. Yani, all types of locks. He doesn't even have the key, Yusuf alayhi salam. The Mufasbirin, when they speak about this, yani, she locked it properly. He's running to a door that's locked. What, what, what sane individual would run to a door that is locked? <laughs> Subhanallah. But what does Allah say? وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَا Whoever fears Allah, Allah would make a way out for him. How did the door open? The individual from the other side opened the door. Subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. You know, do you understand? Sahib al-Bayt opened the house. Do you understand? The individual opened the door. Allah made a way out for him. When Musa alayhi salam, when he come to the sea, and, he, and Bani, yani Bani Israel are behind him, they're saying, إِنَّا لَمُدْرَكُونَ We're going to be, they're going to, they're going to catch up to us. We're gone, we're finished. Subhanallah. Kalla inna ma'ya rabbi sayyadeen. No, my Lord is with me. I'm surrendering. Allah's got my back. I've got a relationship with Allah where Allah is not going to let me down. I'm open with Him. I know I've acknowledged my weakness. Indeed, my Lord is with me. Sayyadeen. He will guide me. Allah will guide you. Allah will guide all these people. What happens? Allah told him to do his bit. And فَوْحَيْنَا إِلَى مُوسَىٰ أَنِ اضْرِبْ بِعَصَاكَ الْبَحْرِ So we commanded Musa to strike the sea. فَانْفَلَقَ and then it split. Mm. Subhanallah. He surrendered. And that's why we're leaders in community. People are tackling these things. You have to be like Musa alayhi salam and, and Yusuf alayhi salam. Where first you surrender. And then you do your bit. You do your bit. You make dua to Allah. You surrender. Allah will show you the way. Say, Yahdi, and He will guide me. And then He saved Bani Israel. Likewise, but what we're saying is that we can say, yeah, these issues, rizq here, here and there. But you know what it really is, bro? Going back to Allah. Being one, getting closer to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even Allah says, Utlu ma uhiya ilayka min al kitab wa aqimi al salata inna al salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar wa la dhikru allahi akbar wa allahu ya'lamu ma tasna'oon. Allah says, Recite what is revealed to you from the book. Have that relationship with the Qur'an. And then Allah says, yani build that relationship with the Qur'an. وَأَقِيمِ الصَّلَةِ And establish the prayer. That bond, that sila, that, that connection between you and Allah. That, that joins you between, and Allah Azza wa Jal. Subhanahu wa ta'ala is your prayer. Indeed, the prayer forbids one from indecent and immoral evil actions. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. So really, when your salah is on point, when your Islam means to you, I'm going to take every day as it comes. I know tomorrow I'm in my grave. I know I might have a lot of hopes. I might be family planning. But I know what I'm going to do strategically. I'm going to take every day as it comes. And I'm going to take it gradually. And I'm not going to let shaitan. Allah says, he promises them. Yeah, you're going to live. You're going to be rich in the future. Where you men need him. And he gives them false hopes. Yeah, don't worry. You're going to establish that house back home. You're going to have your, you know, you, for example, your mortgage here. You're going to have your house paid off. وَمَا يَعِدُهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا But shaitan only gives them deceptions, deceives them. That's why you take every day as it comes, bro. When we take every day as it comes, and we build that relationship with Allah, and we know, and we surrender, and we understand, then alhamdulillah, you taste real iman. Then alhamdulillah, you can start dealing with issues because you know you're not alone. You know you're not alone. You know that you have. And that's why, bro, you're saying surrender. What does it mean? What do we say whenever we hear the adhan speaking about prayer? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There's no might, no will except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the verse goes on to say, bro, wa la dhikrullahi akbar. The dhikr of Allah, the remembrance of Allah is greater than any pleasure, attachment that you can have in this world. Be it pornography, be it alcohol, be it anything. The dhikr of Allah, the remembrance of Allah that you have, that you have with one, that relationship that you have, Trust me, you ain't going to find nothing like it. Trust me. You know, get millions. Get billions. You know, people commit suicide. They have this wealth. Nothing's going to be like that. And then Allah says at the end of the verse, to keep us in check, Wallahu ya'lamu ma tasna'un. And Allah knows what you do. Yes, you're going to have ups and downs. Life is full of hardships. Life is full of turmoil. Allah says you'll go from hardship upon hardship. Who says that this place is, you know, full of joy and na'im? Obviously, what we're trying to say is that 
You know that you can have weaknesses. You know you can have good days, bad days. Surrender. Remember Allah is Basir, Khabir, watching us. And then we deal with the problem with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sorry, bro, man. You know, I kind of go deep in. No, and, uh, uh, you, know, you know how it is. So you, you've been with me. So. Just wanted to add on that. Is that okay? Yeah, 100%, Basically, man. Um, as, uh, you know, Ustad mentioned, right? Even a lot of addiction recovery programs say this is a... Any addiction is a misinterpreted yearning for God, right? No, no. Even non-Muslim no, no. programs. No. So that person who is drinking alcohol and is an alcoholic, right? Really and truly what he's looking for, he's looking for uh, a relationship with his creator, the source, right? Uh, that, you know, drug addict is looking for Allah, right? As crazy it may sound, but this is what's going on, right? Even that porn addict, he's looking for Allah. Why? Because Allah says in the Quran, Allah bi zikrillahi al kulub, right? Verily in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find rest. Allah. Saying that nothing else, right? No pornography, no drug, no money, nothing will give you that uh, you know, sakina, that contentment that oh, you're looking for, other than your connection, your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And it's other than that, it's just like, you know, you're, you're pouring into a glass and the glass has a hole, right? It's just leaking out. The only thing, and that's why they call it a God hole, a, that God hole that every one of us have inside of us and that can only be filled with God, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, touching on what Ustaz said, that, see, where does all, right, we know now the problem is pornography, addiction, whatever, but that's the symptom, right? The cause is the underlying issues, right? And where does all stress, fear, anxiety, depression, where does it come from? Right? It comes from this uh, disconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what we try to teach in the program. To have this relationship with Allah where, you know, your, your will is aligned with Allah's will, right? What's the meaning of a Muslim? To submit your will to Allah. So again, going back to, you know, when I say wake up in the morning, Right, hand over your day to Allah and live with Allah aligned with Allah's will. It's only when we have a problem with the will of Allah, with the qadr of Allah, that we will go into our own problems, right? Our fears and our anxieties and our you know negative thinking patterns. But um, you want to develop this relationship where you start off your day with Allah and you develop that relationship with anything that happens during your day, right? May Allah protect all of us. I mean. But if you get into a car accident, Qadr Allah wa ma sha'afal Right, someone dies from your family Right Qadr Allah wa ma sha'afal Meaning that I say these things because This is another cause for relapses Brothers mentioned when there's a death in the family When emotions become unbearable mm. Life gets tough mm. And then we, Allah is the solution But They go in It's this misdirected You know, place what if there's people listening who, uh, you know, after this podcast have decided, you know what, I'm going to make a step um, to make a change, but they're not at the level that, that that we're discussing. They're not at the level where you're talking about brothers who have made a change and then they've relapsed. What about people who are at the beginning of that journey? What do you advise those people? What do you mean, as in uh, the beginning of that journey, in that they've never, they've never, it's never been something that they've even broken away from, or maybe it's not even been something that they've deemed like a serious thing that there's a problem. And now they listen to the podcast and they're going, "Well, I have that problem. I didn't realize it was a problem. Do you know, I didn't realize I was addicted." So at the very beginning of that journey, it reminds me of a story of one of our coaches uh, mentioned on Facebook. He said, "So there was this young man. Uh, I believe he was Muslim. He had a problem, right? He knew, you know, pornography is coming in the way of his life, right? Um, pornography addiction. So he went." to some counseling sessions and uh, there he met people. He met people who have been to prison because of sexual assault, right? He met people who have been divorced because of sex addiction. And he thought to himself, you know, I'm not that bad. These guys are way up there, right, you know? And he saw uh, recovery, right? He, he saw the fruits of recovery. He was sober for about six months and he left recovery, right? He stopped taking care of the issues. He came five years, after five years, and uh, I believe he, got caught watching child pornography or something. He was divorced. So he had all the problems that these guys had, right? Five years down the line. So that's what we're trying to say, Akhir. When I deal with youngsters, we get youngsters as young as 13 contacting us, but we can't really, you know, legally, we can't really help them, I guess, much, right? Um, but, you know, again, we try to, uh, you know, put stuff on social media, on a YouTube channel, whatever, to educate people. But what I would say is I don't want these youngsters to go through what these people have been through, right? Do you want to go through that, those, that divorce? Do you want to mm. go through losing your kids, getting, being caught watching pornography, losing your career? Uh, there's many brothers who have said they failed years of university uh, because of this problem. It got in the way. You know, do you want to go through the suicidal thoughts, getting into drugs, 
right? Because yeah. basically there's detrimental effects as well. So when, when, when someone is at the beginning of an addiction, they're probably the most fragile. And, 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 and generally from an Islamic narrative as well, when there's a problem, you dress it when it's there and then, as in a sense where if it's, you're exposed to it and then you should deal with it, you know, at the most urgent time possible, isn't it? As soon as possible. So remember, there's ripple effects to everything. As we were saying, bro, like someone, early stages, I'm not married. Shaitan might come to him and say, yeah, well, you're not really deep in it. Do you understand? You're just maybe starting here. But remember, Shaitan takes us on a journey. You know, he Shaitan's got time. Yeah, he's got time, bro. Very he's got, matter of fact, on that point of time, you know what Allah says? Allah says about the لَأَقْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ صِرَاطَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ That I would surely sit on your right path and I wait for them. If you're sitting, are you, are you tired, bro? If you're sitting, you're relaxing, you're chilling. Mm. If you're standing up, you might feel a bit tired. But when you're sitting, Allah, you, لَأَقْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ I will sit down on that path, meaning... I ain't going nowhere. I'm relaxed. I ain't going to feel fatigued. I ain't going to feel anything. I'm in a position where I could be here forever. Point is, is that, yeah, so there's a journey that he takes you on. And you know what? And if we don't address it as soon as possible, as you said, bro, these things, then they affect your studies. I'm as a young child, you're not married. You're not married, but they affect your studies. They affect, affect your productivity. They affect you. Now you become lazy. Now you become potato couch. May Allah protect us. Now your parents become upset with you. Yeah, your parents become upset with you. They're probably like, do something with your life. And you're feeling as if like, uh, you, you understand? You, you, mm. you, you're, you're feeling a bit hopeless. So what does that mean? Anxiety, depression. Oh, I'm a useless individual now. What does it lead to, bro? These other thoughts come in. Do you understand? So that's what I'm trying to say. Mm. Generally, everyone needs help. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa needed help. The Sahaba helped him. The Ansar were called the helpers of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Messenger of Allah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam requires help. The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who are we to think that, you know, I don't need help. We all need help, bro. So that's why it's important that if someone's going through it for the early stages, then we say that even if, you know, it's not my tezkiyah, even if it's just your local imam, you know, even if it's just someone that you can open up to, that you know, is sincere and wants the best for you and is not going to, do you understand, give you the wrong advice. Bismillah. And that small little step, Allah sees that goodness in your heart, as you said, and Allah, inshallah, will make a way out for you, bin Allah ta'ala. You know, the brain is a record of the past. That's what they say. So what these youngsters have to realize, every image, right, every video you see, that's going to be stored in, the br in your brain mm. for the rest of your life. Yeah. You will be able to think of that image or that video you've seen when you're maybe, you know, 70, 60 years old, right? So it's very dangerous because, you know, I was reading an article on uh, uh, cannabis addiction, yeah. right? And they're saying people who tend to get into, uh, you know, drug addiction or smoking weed at yeah. early age, you know, when their brain is developing, you know, there's that plasticity yeah. aspect of the brain, right? You're just, uh, you know, you're going through adolescence and your brain is developing and it's mm. making its pathways and so on. So if you... Now I've been watching pornography, mm. your brain has become hardwired to this. Allah, you have pathways and that now built into your brain, hardwired. Yeah, many hardwired pathways. And what happens is there's other studies where people with pornography addiction, they have lower stress response, mm. right? So because they're used to this immediate gratification. So tough exam, let me go watch pornography. Uh, problem at work, let me go and escape. So they're not dealing mm. with life as it comes, right? So they're not developing emotionally. Right? So there's, there's this emotional instability. They're not developing emotional intelligence. And it reminds me of one, uh, one guy, right? He said like he's six years old and he's like maybe in his 30s, 40s. I said, what do you mean six? He goes, because I stopped growing the day I became a, a sex addict, right? And now I'm, he's sober basically for six years. And he goes, emotionally, I'm now six years old. Because that's what happens. When a person you know, goes to drugs, goes to pornography, you stop dealing with life and you're... Just your response to life becomes very weak, right? And another thing I want to mention is that you have to realize, right, you are not your addiction. Talking about the shaitan, yeah. you have to realize that, you know, you are not your thoughts. You are not your addiction. You have to realize that you have these entities within you, right? The Qareen. Mm. His mission is to misguide us, to destroy us. So everything we go through, this Qareen has a lot of experience, have, has a lot of knowledge, like you said, from beginning of time. Right? And it specifically, it knows you, it's been with you right? for a very long time. And it's not going to leave you until you leave this world. Right? Mm. So it has all the tricks of the trade. It knows what made uh, 
you know, mm. what made you slip, what made you go towards this, what made you sin, and so on. So you have to realize you are not your addiction, right? Learn to separate the two. Because why I say this? Because a lot of brothers, right, they mention these abhorrent, intrusive thoughts, right? I'm seeing men, women as sexual objects, feeling bad, right? Um, uh, you know, seeing someone on the road and I can see them, uh, you know, as an object. This is something that's going to happen. Because if you're watching pornography for hours on end every day, your mind is going to, there's going to be this pornification of the mind taking Hard place. Wiring, as yeah. And you're going to start to view the world through a sexual filter. But you have to realize that is not you. I say this because you have to learn to detach from the inner oh. addict, right? And look at things constructively, logically. Mm. It's like, um, uh, you know, a physician or, uh, you know, a doctor operating, you know, doing heart surgery, for instance, right? Yes. You know, if that doctor gets emotional, right, with the patient, he'll probably kill the patient. So he has to be very professional. Yeah. And we also try to t treat everyone that comes as a patient, right? Because at the end of the day, no one is watching pornography, going to escorts for no reason. I'm not justifying it, but this is the reality. No one is smoking drugs, drinking alcohol for no reason. They're doing it for a reason. It's coming from a place, you know, they say every action, it comes from a good intention. So it's serving some kind of purpose for them. And this is what we need to, first of all, realize. Well, the people who want to, people who believe in your message, perhaps they're not, they, perhaps they don't have, uh, or they're not battling this issue. Um, what could they, how could they benefit my task? How could they support it? I see that you have like a donation that you, people can support by don donating a membership. Um, how else can they support? Um, well, so we'll try, I'll try come a bit forward and let me see if, as in like your whole seat, try move it forward a bit and let me see because I think Sorry, you're, coming, pulling. <laughs> you're pulling, <laughs> uh, pulling me, so uh, I but. told you. Yeah, try it because I think that you get out of focus when you lean back a bit. Is that right? So yeah, try to see if you can come a bit more forward. A bit more forward. Because uh, let right, me move yeah. the mic. That's a lot better. Is that better? Yeah, you're much more because we're trying to get you both in focus on the same uh, on the same camera. So uh, it requires uh, we haven't made it yet to the point where we can get a, an individual camera on each of you. Oh, right, inshallah. Yeah, the double thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So how can people support the 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 project? Um, yeah, if they, if, they, if they don't feel like they necessarily need the support, but they, they believe in this message. I would say um, create awareness, right? Reach out to us. Maybe that's if that's going through, because we're trying to work with a few masajid, you know, maybe doing some events, uh, whatever it may be, in whatever shape or form, however you can help, try to, you know, get involved. And, um, you know, we can't, we can't shy away from this topic. It's a real problem, right? And it's causing huge problems within our communities so um reach out get you know we, we want to do workshops and sh we want to do workshops where we can educate uh, you know local mosques even imams right people are dealing with the youth uh, about this problem and you know the basic stuff that we've gone through the problem and the solution uh, yes we have the donation link all of that inshallah it's an amana we take this stuff very seriously and it will contribute towards the work that we do uh, if you're a coach if you if you're involved in this field field contact us Right, you can also coach people with us and help us. Um, other than that, um, just yeah, general awareness, I guess. You know, if you could, we I think we need to get the uh, Muslim community more involved, as in yeah. imams, masajid, uh, so we can really, you know, uh, create more awareness. Inshallah. Do you think we'll ever come to a point where people, because you were talking about how I suppose like it's a taboo subject, and so like all these other communities and religions are kind of uh, battling it on a head on and, and and it seems like I don't know much about kind of other organizations doing this kind of work. So I'm, I'm ignorant to it. But it seems like my test care is one of the very few, at least, mm -hmm. um, with, such a, with such a big issue. So do you think that it will ever be at a situation where it's spoken about? about okay, Because the other, the other thing is, is the generation above the generation right now. Mm -hmm. Like, it's an awkward conversation to have with even the above generation, right? Yeah, very um, So do you think that's going to take an entire... It's all right, man. Just make noise. It's all good. Trust me. Um, the, the, do you think that it's gonna, we have to wait an entire generation before this becomes a norm? Yeah, so I, I, a few points on this. So firstly, the reason why is perhaps you can't open up to the, the older generation or generation above us is because, as you said, bro, 20 years ago, there was no such thing as smartphones. There was no such thing as, uh, you know, 
well, internet was just about there and it was just those yeah. big PCs with the big, you know, mashallah, it's like a, mashallah, it's not even a flat screen. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. Everyone knows who's, who's been those there, you know, it's been around the age. Yeah, exactly. The, flip come the out. phones oh, were just coming out, exactly. So that's why, yeah. um, you know, they're oblivious to it. Now, maybe it's perhaps our generation started exposing. Now the youth has become, become more of a prominent issue. Now it's important as well that I think as well that there would be a lot more community cohesion when dealing with this issue. And it's very important. And I think, I remember when I was in a masjid many years ago, it was probably many years ago, but there was even, you know, this was addressed to the Imam at that time. And there has to be, you know, some techies, some Muslim organizations that put a framework, you know, like YouTube has got the kids channel now. Mm. So when you type in, say, for example, uh, Oman Hannah, you get the videos Oma and Hannah instead of you know adult content or mm. where, I'm, where I'm speaking more adult content. I mean like adults having conversations, more kid related. So a platform where there's a Wi-Fi service, but then there's IT savvy guys that can put a barrier around the internet, which you know prevents adult content coming in. And that's where techie, that's where everyone's there got their sadaqah. Yeah, I think there. that I, I think that you're right in that. You know, we often hear about there's a different role people have different skills in Ummah and we should use these different skills to benefit in different ways and you're right I think like there are people who have knowledge in like for example tech but um, th- th- I think with something like this people have different skills and all of them can be brought to the table to benefit a situation like this mm. like and you, you look at really specific specialities that people have like somebody here might be listening who's like a UX researcher like their job is to research how um, users experience apps, software and stuff like that. That's so specific, right? Mm. But even that could be so perfectly aligned with this because they understand consumer psychology than any of us. They understand what makes a person stop scrolling on Instagram. They may understand what makes whether a yellow button or a red button makes you purchase that item. If they can understand that, they could probably also understand what deters a person from falling into a trap right online what uh, and then and then when an app is created that allows you to that 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 that, that i suppose like takes away those temptations that we would never even thought how could a ux researcher impact this right so imagine all the other fields that we have where people have skills that we don't even know about we don't even understand but they could benefit these projects and then when you see like even now politely when you look at the my taskia website you think it, and it's it, and it's an amazing website, but you can see that the brothers have done their best to put put this thing together to to make it happen because it's needed, right? But there's probably someone out there who supports what you guys do, who is like upon the hack, who who could probably come in and say, you know what, guys, let's let's change your internal system. I can see right now, for example, you're running a forum. What's a better idea is that nowadays we can have a system where we can turn it into an app, for example, right? Or or we can like have like this like an app that has like a panic button on it, mm-hmm. and you press that button when like yeah, right. it's peak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And we call you instantly. Mm-hmm. Yo, you, you you press the panic button. Mm-hmm. You, you know where you at? I'm at home. Yeah, right, yeah. leave your house. You know what I mean? Like because because it matters that much. Right. But why isn't a app developer coming and saying, bro, let's do it. Let's get it. We've got a panic button here. Then like, we'll change the website up so it's like this. And, it's easier. and someone who does, who specializes in Instagram ads and Facebook ads, like we'll put ads here when, when people, because bro, nowadays, if people are thinking about, oh, I've got, I want to get a new outfit for my, um, for my like, I've got an event coming up, I need an outfit. The, the tech is so advanced bro mm. that it feels like I'm just thinking about needing an outfit for my next event bro and then an advert has come up about an outfit that's perfect for me mm. obviously I might have spoken to Siri or I might have like searched something but, but but because it's so advanced I don't even realise that it's technology has picked up my subliminal actions mm. and has shown me an outfit that's perfect for it yeah. Yeah. do you know what I mean but bro why can't we do that in this case why can't we have like technology started to pick up on like, like for example, we have this thing called Facebook Pixel, right? Yeah. What a Facebook Pixel does, as far as I'm aware, is do you know how, for example, you might be on ASOS trying to find an outfit mm. and then you think, nah, I'm not interested. Bro, and then you're scrolling on Instagram and that exact outfit has been advertised mm. to you. 
That's because they've implemented things like the Facebook picture yeah. or things cookies. like Google Tag Manager, right, cookies. Yeah. But why can't we have the Islamic equivalent to Google Tag Manager, to Facebook Pixel, yeah. where they clock your starting to search things that are getting a bit yeah. out You're of the right, comfort bro. zone right. and they just show you up my test gear. Or they say, hey, we noticed, bro, just like uh, um, Apple will, will give me a, um, Apple will give me a notification when they're like, hey, no, you know what? Like, for example, uh, you know the iQuran app? Yes. On a Friday app, you get a notification, hey, we noticed it's Friday and you still haven't opened up the app to read Surah Kaf. Mm -hmm. How amazing is that like yeah. kind of concept, right? Um, that kind of thing. Or Apple will say, hey, you've used your phone a lot today. Yeah. Take a break. Oh, your, but your watch, it goes, you've been sat down for a while, stand up and stretch. Mm -hmm. But look how clever these things are getting. Bro, trust me, there are Muslims. I but I know people in these companies Right, these like, some of the world's largest companies that are in like the big boy positions, and they're Muslims, bro. Not increase them. And they're Muslims. And I was shocked, bro. One time I heard one brother he was talking to me, and he said, um, "Oh, one of the guys who listens to freshly, one of my friends, he listens to freshly grounded, and he was one of the founder founders of this specific company. And this company is a company that probably all of us use, right? And I was shocked. I didn't even know that, that the founder was a Muslim." Wow. But the point is, you don't know who's listening. You don't know who's. But that, but that person, may Allah bless him. Maybe he believes in the Fresh Uganda project, right? Mm -hmm. But like, and we could do with help. Do you know what I mean? But like, but maybe he just didn't realize that there's a situation where like it's open to that. So my point is that all of our, we, you don't know who's listening. There, there could be brothers and sisters listening now who could actually benefit my, the Mytaskia like um, project now. But they need to take it from having an idea to saying, you know what, I've got this idea about this panic button. I can make you know, it happen. On that point as well, like, um, that's why we're here. Let's be honest. My Teski is here, not just to help you know, the victims, those suffering, but to reach out to Ummah. It's a problem. We need your help. We need your expertise. Let's take it on as a community. Let's yeah. take it on all together. And that's why, as you were saying, bro, like everyone has their their skill that Allah has blessed them that they give sadaqah. Sadaqah is not just given in charity. Someone who's, who's a you know, heart surgeon, his sadaqah, you know, like little hearts, we've, we've raised for you know, these causes, the doctors that we fly out with that perform those, those, those life-saving heart operations, bro, that is their sadaqah. That is their back to the community. Likewise, someone who's a tech-savvy individual that can put these boundaries in place or make such you know, infrastructure within the tech you know, mindset, then this is what we're saying that we need to address as a community. Like even myself, bro, I don't really, I, yani, I don't, I've never been on a podcast. It's a third podcast, but I do a charity work. You're smashing it. No, no, no. Love it's a worthy cause because the worthy cause. I speak about worthy things, and I and I swallow my my weaknesses. Likewise, bro, I've come here today with you know even same with Abu Musa. He's never been on a podcast. <laughs> He's never been exposed before and in a sense of that. You know I mean, but but it's an issue. We so. we we have to come out here so. and deal with it, and that's why we're saying we're reaching out, my Tezkia, you know, to all of the Muslims that can support. You know, reach out, let us know how you can help, you know, uh, you know, our infrastructure, the program that we have from a tech perspective, from your, you know, maybe you've got a PhD in psychology. You know, of course, we have, you know, done a lot of study, a lot of vigorous studies been put into the program, but everything, you know, challenges are coming left, right and center. New, you know, new um, obstacles, new pit holes. We need to address them. We need to be up to date. So that's why we're saying as well, this is why we're here, bro. We wouldn't mm. be here for, 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 you know, alhamdulillah, yani, for no reason, do you understand? Yeah, do you know what, on that point, I know this is completely separate, but I just remembered a WhatsApp message I once received, right, uh, from a brother. And um, he sent me a WhatsApp message and he was talking about this question that was asked to, a sh to this scholar and the scholar replied, right, something like that. But it's a quote that I found powerful and he said that, um, he said, I f this scholar, yeah, said, I find that the time I commit the most sins is when um, my belly is full. This, in the sense that he said that, he said that, um, and I would never relate it before this. He said that when I satisfy one desire, it makes me want to satisfy more desires. Mm -hmm. Like I've satisfied the desire of food and actually that shocked me because, bro, how often do we satisfy the desire, the desire of food? Probably like sometimes, maybe every day. You, fa bro, how often is it like, bro? You know what? I'm just really craving this thing. Let's, bro. I'm guilty of going. You know what? Are you? I'm craving this thing. Let's just jump in the car and do a drive through. Why not? Yeah, which is fine, bro. But what you've done there is, if you take the food aspect out of it, you've satisfied the desire. You've got a fancy this. Let's do it. 
And it's like, well, it's easy to satisfy a desire. What's the next one? Mm. Actually, that shook me. That really what's, benefited me, man. What is you're dealing with the same parts of the brain. Right. There's another thing. We make sure we emphasize people's diet, people's sleeping routine. Um, and it's all to do with, for instance, the brain chemicals, right? The do- dopamine, for instance. Right? Dopamine, you get, um, you release dopamine when you have a chocolate, when you, when you eat, uh, when, you know, you might drink a fizzy drink, when you exercise, endorphins, likewise, when you're watching pornography, you're having intimacy, you're also releasing these hormones. So it's all, they're all interrelated. So you get it? And people do mention this. And that's why I recommend that people really, uh, you know, b- be careful with the caffeine and sugar intake. A lot of recovering addicts, they will quit caffeine and sugar because they say that it, uh, you know, seems to trigger the same part of the really? brain that deals with the drug addiction. How do you, okay, how do you use that part of the brain for good? Example, how do I use that and become addicted to working out i'd love to be addicted to work i hate yeah. working out bro i hate it i see the benefit of it i was i got to a point where i was yeah. but it's hard bro. and when you fall off it how do you use that i'm addicted to working out alhamdulillah, like alhamdulillah. gym all right whether you know at times it was boxing and so on initially it's hard isn't it right so you have to go out your comfort zone and that's another thing like you know with uh, with addicts you know they're very comfortable being in that kind of you know bubble the comfort zone you have to learn to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And uh, sometimes you just have to push yourself. For instance, if I give you my uh, uh, you know, experience, gym initially was hard. Initially, 10 years ago, I had to go with friends. And a lot of times I'd be like, I don't want to go. My friend would push me. Again, environment as well. Uh, but alhamdulillah, I got to a place after a year. Now I've been training for about five years on my own. I okay, but my, my point someone. though is the, that these desires that we're talking about, pornography, um, food, Etc. Ones that, ones like that. The reason we are so attracted to them is because you get an instant hit of dopamine. Mm-hmm. It seems like you don't get that instant hit of dopamine with things that are actually good for you, right? Mm-hmm. Like, how can we get an instant hit of dopamine by going to the gym? It's it, it's it's not it's, it's prolonged. It's 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 you have to train yourself to have. Um, what is it called? Uh, gratitude. Uh, what do you call it? Gratif- uh, Grat- not instant gratification, but delayed yeah. gratification, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. But is there not a way of getting into gratification with good things? I'm just, I'm thinking there, out loud. There is. So, so I, I like what you mentioned. I want to address this concept. So even Muhammad said that if a, if, a, if, a, if a man was given a mountain of gold, he would want another one and Sorry. another one and nothing, you know, uh, would, would put that desire to, to an end except the turab in the ground. Except I eat there. So the point is, what I'm trying to say here is that generally there's a natural inclination for more. The more you feed your desires, the more you're going to want more. Yeah. So I'll be, I'll be, it'll be exact, from even the most minute things, you might have a meal in front of you. The way the brother's eating that meal so quick, you can <laughs> link it to a desire problem. Well, there's water. He drinks it so much. Like there, there's something behind that. Do you understand? That generally would have ripple effects or, you know, uh, sort of effects on other parts of his life. Point I'm trying to make, bro, is that really you need to understand is that real richness, real pleasure, as we we're saying, bro, is coming down to the crux. It's, it's being... You know, ghina nafs is being content. You know why? Because Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in a hadith, uh, whoever's greatest concern is the dunya. Allah would put poverty in between his eyes. Meaning that he has houses, he has assets, but he still fears poverty. He still fears the future. And then Allah will scatter his affairs and nothing of the dunya would come to him except that which is written for him. But listen to this now. Imagine now you change your whole mindset. You change it now. وَمَنْ كَانَتْ أَكْبَرُ هَمِّهِ الْآخَرَ And whoever's main focus is the akhira, جَعَلَ اللَّهُ غِنَاهُ فِي قَلْبِهِ Allah will put richness in his heart. Because it's, يعني, true richness is contentment. is to be content. Do you understand? To have boundaries when eating, bro. Even when eating the smallest of things, bro. Remember, like, how, we're not even programmed to have boundaries when eating. But Islamically, we are encouraged to do so. Sure. Remember, bro, there's a sure. similar way of eating. But yeah. when we go and munch with the brothers or with the sisters, as in the sisters with the sisters, or you just go out, you, you eat to your full. That's not encouraged. So what is that? Even these small things, you know, they have effects. Sure. Because what is, we're feeling our desire. And as you said, bro, that leads to another desire. And what is it? We become desire machines. We become people that are enslaved to our desires when really we have to channel them like we channel everything else like the time we spend the time we spend on our tv the time we spend studying the time everything yeah, needs to have a balance, balance. and likewise our desires need to have a balance and only when we balance them would we be successful you, you know what i um 
a few weeks after Ramadan, right? Maybe a few weeks after Ramadan, I started, or maybe the beginning of August, I started a diet, right? Which was um, there were certain things that were not in my that I'm not allowed to eat, right? And I gave myself one day. It's just like typical. You give you give yourself one day cheat day a week, right? Mm. And at first it was difficult, and now I've become addicted to it to the point where if somebody was now when somebody offers me like something that I would love, right? It's so easy for me to turn away now, turn away from it now because I built up momentum, mm -hmm. right? And also I know that there's a day where I'm going to be able to have a bit of it. But also it's not really that. It's more so the momentum I built up. I built up a like habit. a habit now, and I'm enjoying the fact that the discipline is addictive, right? Mm. However, my point still remains that it took me maybe one week to go. Well, I've done a week. Now I can do two, and then two weeks. Now I can do three. But I still didn't get that instant gratification. I didn't reward. I wasn't. Is it, I'm saying, is there a way we can do, I don't know, do psychologists say there's a way you can give yourself a little win at the end of a day or like give yourself a reward for, 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 for the discipline and then can we relate that back to this? Like, because I'm sure that you can go, all right, I've been sober for a week. I, I can do two weeks. Mm. I've done two weeks, I can do a month. I've done a month, I can do six months. I can do six months, I'm close to a year now. I've done half a year. But there's still no instant gratification there. I'm just trying to understand the psychology. Is there a way we can we can do that program though? Is it just is it just that nothing great comes easy? Uh, to be honest, I don't know if Faisal want, um, uh, Musa wants to mention something. Sorry, but um, do you want to mention something, bro? Before do you know what the reality is, Aki? Look, you acted right. You acted. Uh, and you started this uh, diet and so on, right? right. Which was and difficult at first. It was difficult, but you acted. Sometimes we just need to act mm. and the feelings follow, right? We can't wait for the feeling to be right to act. Because if that was the case, Akhi, then uh, I might not be praying. I might not be going to the masjid, mm. right? I, uh, you know, may not be doing many things, right? Alhamdulillah, we get up uh, and go to work because we know it pays the bills. We have to pay uh, uh, rent at the end of the month and so on, whatever. That's very is. true. That's very right? true. So what is, it reminds me of one brother who mentioned, for instance, uh, he's in recovery as well. He said his wife asked him to do the dishes and he didn't want to do it. He goes, I was in a proper bad mood, ready to argue and have this session, right? <laughs> you know, argument session. But he said, I just put one foot in front of the other, somehow got myself to the kitchen, the sink, washed that first plate. And he goes, immediately the feeling changed, right? Mm. And he goes, you know, I started, you know, the feeling changed and I felt happy That's now. I was, I, I was just felt. doing it, right? So sometimes you just have to act and the feeling follows, right? We never wait for the feeling to act. And secondly, like you said, one day at a time, recovery, we emphasize this. You can't say, because a lot of people have this mentality, I'm not going to uh, mm. act out for the rest of my life, right? Swearing to Allah, I'm going to be sober for a year. I'm not going to act out in Ramadan. I'm saying don't even promise tomorrow. Right? Yeah. Don't even promise Allah because you know you can't promise what you can do on a daily basis, one day at a time. Promise Allah that I will today work towards my recovery. I will do my recovery actions and only you can keep me sober, Ya Allah. Right? So having that one day at a time mentality, Alhamdulillah, a lot of brothers see results. They mention this when they join recovery. They say, you know what, it's one day at a time thing actually gets me. That is what's going to get you. Ten, ten years down the line, ten years so. of sobriety. You're still going to be that one day of the right, right? Could I mention something, Facebook? Yeah. So even um, emotions have to be channeled. When I'm stuck in traffic, I want to put my leg down on the gas. But yeah. that's going to cause Good. more harm than good, right? You know, so, so generally there's this concept that we have to understand that emotions have to be channeled, desires have to be channeled. Matter of fact, 100%. The, 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 the hellfire, as the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi taught us, is covered with desires. Is covered with things which are easy, those things which you know are pleasurable. Do you understand? So, what is it? What are we being taught is that our whole life has to be, you know, covered by boundaries, covered by limitations. Like our eyesight has a limit, our hearing has a limit, our logic has a limit. We can't comprehend, you know, our Rabb Tabarak wa Taala. Likewise, our desires, we have to channel them, and that's why sometimes, as we were saying, as we mentioned. When you follow your emotions sometimes, uh, it can cause more harm mm. than good. When you follow those pleasures. But there is a satisfaction, man. It goes back to the ayah, bro. Because we can't deny what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. It's only in the remembrance of Allah that the hearts find rest. Like so the sweetness of Iman. Sweetness of Iman. Right. So you're praying. You remember, you're, you're in the mosque two days a week. Three, you know, when you go into the mosque, first, you come out, you feel that relief. You feel yeah, like yeah, yeah. there's a whole... Now, you do that three days, four days. As you said, one week, two weeks. You, you read up on the, the, the merits 
of these actions. You read up on the reward prepared when you say subhanallah with fear as well whether your actions are accepted or not. But you, you know that Allah has prepared for those who pray in jama'ah you know, 27 times more reward than the one who prays at home. Allah has prepared, you know, you know, for example, for the, for the sister that performs hajj, you know, that she's done, you know, any, uh, jihad in the path of Allah, as Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that is their, their form of doing that. Do you understand? Mm. So this is what we're trying to say is that when you acknowledge these things and you know that you're doing it for your creator, bro, your creator, the one who fashioned you, created you, knows your mm. ins and outs, knows you better than your husband, your spouse, your children, and you're being sincere in one, that is the most satisfactional thing that you can have in your life because you're acknowledging that you're bringing it back home you're bringing mm. it to the one that matters you're bringing it يعني, to the one alimun bidhati sudur he knows the secrets you know of what's in, in our chest in our hearts he knows our weaknesses and that's where real satisfaction comes but remember bro يعني, no one could just practice today yeah they'll feel that iman but remember bro Nowadays, I'll tell you what's happened now. Nowadays, Iman is like, yeah, let me watch that two-minute YouTube clip. Let me get Iman boost. Let me watch that five-minute, you know, uh, Iman booster. We shouldn't be feeding our desires like this, bro. Mm. We should teach in discipline, the duros. You know, the people of the past, they would spend hours and hours in classes. And, 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 and they would self-discipline themselves. There's come this notion now that, you know what? I'm looking for a one-minute clip. I'm looking for that 30-second Iman dosa. Of course, yeah, I mean, these are things. But what I'm trying to say, these are helpful. But then, remember, we still... That is technically linked to our desires and what we want. We want things quickly. When really, you know, Jannah and inheriting these things come through patience, come through perseverance. You know, as Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said that Jannah was covered with hardships, i.e., you know, waking up for Fajr. It's not, it's not easy. Do you understand? You know, being consistent in your prayers. But then you look at the greater goal. You know, you see that your desire, that pleasure that you've, that you, that pleasure that you've, that you felt for a, a 10 seconds or 20 seconds, when you go like, SubhanAllah, in Jannah, that's eternal. Wow. In Jannah, that's, that's forever. It's not, and it doesn't give the effect of after feeling, you know, guilty or feeling like I need more. Then you'll be like, SubhanAllah, the one that created Jannah said that there's Naeem, an everlasting happiness, you know, and joy. Then you're like, you know what? Let me prioritize my life. Let me put things into perspective. Mm -hmm. Let me prioritize and know that this really matters. And this is where, you know, the real life is. You know, as Rasulullah said, when he would see something that would amaze me, he would say, لَبَّيْكَ إِنَّ الْعَيْشَ عَيْشُ الْآخِرَةِ That we are at your service, O oh Allah. Yani, indeed, the real life, the real enjoyment, the real satisfaction is in the next life. You see that car, you see that, you know, that person that's doing good here, mashallah, may Allah bless them, we're pleased with the qadr of Allah, but then you know, أَعْدَدْتُ لِعِبَادِي مَا لَا عَيْنٌ رَأَتْ وَلَا أُذِنٌ سَمِعَتْ I prepared for my servants what no eye has seen hmm. well, and no ear has heard and no heart has dwelled upon. And you're like, wow, you know what? I'm going to take it every day as it comes. I'm on a journey with Allah. There's no finish line. You oh, just no, started practicing not. today. Don't think that the one who was practicing 10 years ago is better than you. No, this is your qadr. This is what Allah decreed for you. And there's no finish line like, yeah, oh yeah, I've learned this much knowledge. No, there's no finish line. You're on a journey. And the most important thing of the journey is not that there's a finish line, but you die on this path. Someone could be practicing for their whole life. Last moments of life, they slip up. Sure. They slip up sure. And that's why if you're thinking You know what I'm not like so and so I've gone through madness I've gone through Trials and tribulations No Allah understands you Allah feels you Allah understands What you've gone through And what's important You might not be A qari like that individual You might not be An abid like that individual You might not know Arabic like that individual But you're taking Every day as it comes And the most important thing is You want to die on this path Grateful to Allah And thankful And helping all of those around you, be they Muslim, non-Muslim, address issues and just providing pleasure to the people around you. Brother. I remember Ustaz Jamal mentioned um, that, you know, sometimes, for example, like your Quran lesson, I mean, your Quran lesson has been cancelled this week or something. Yeah. Um, and you couldn't make it for a genuine reason. Like, for example, your teacher is on holiday, right? Makes sense Like you're not going to do a lesson yeah. Or There's a wedding next week In your family You can't make that lesson For example He was mentioning that Sometimes what it can be is that That's the excuse That has Or that's not the excuse But that's the 
reason that's been presented to us to make it look like that's the reason but the real reason could be because of a scene you've been stopped from going to that quran yeah. class yeah. do you see what i'm saying like right. it could be that even though like to you it's logical like i was never gonna you're, to you it's like i was never gonna go to it because the wedding was always then mm. but that was the thing that the wedding could have, if the wedding could have been another day do you know what i mean but mm. the point is is that perhaps our scenes can, and I find that motivating, man. I, I think different people are motiv motivated by different things, but I find motivating knowing that I could, you know, um, like this concept of why are you transgressing your own soul? Mm. Like that hits me differently because it's like, oh man, I've got to submit this surah on Sunday or whatever, whatever. Yeah. It could be whatever. I'm not specifically speaking yeah. about Quran memorization, but it could be like, uh, Assignment. A, a assignment, a deal that you got going through that it's looking like it's all going down. You just got the con you got waiting for the contract to get signed, and it could be me that by transgressing against myself loses that because and it's only I've done it to myself. I find that quite motivating, man. Perhaps, perhaps that's wrong. Perhaps I I should be mo it, should, I sh it should be easier for me to be motivated by like Jannah, for example. Mm. But for some reason, I can it, it helps me contextu contextualize that in 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 many ways. Like there's, there could be negative um, effects to me gossiping, backbiting, whatever it may be. Um, and that's why I came to you with that question earlier, Abu Musa, about saying that, do you sometimes find that if these people are coming to you, um, there must be a level of like, they like have a relationship with Allah that it means enough to them for them to like come forward and say, I need to make this change. Yeah. That sometimes it could say, well, perhaps you want to become closer to Allah and that's the thing that clearly means the most to you because you come to us mm -hmm. but what if this thing that you're doing is actually slowly slowly getting you away from Allah maybe that'll, that'll make them think well you know what that's true that's, I value that too much I don't know but but I, I do I, I do agree that one of the things um, one of the things that you mentioned when I said that was very powerful you said um, you said that at the time of the at the time of the addiction, the addiction ignores that, which is very powerful. Yeah. yeah. Let me just fix your camera. Um, yeah, so basically, about you mentioning that, uh, you know, what uh, Uthar Jamal said, right? You have to go back to what Allah tells us, right? Allah says something may be good for you, uh, and you know, you think it's bad for you, but it's actually good, yeah. right? And something is good for you, and you think it's bad. Allah knows, but you know not, right? Yeah. Meaning that it's all going back to the entities within us, right? Allah says, shaitan is your enemy, open enemy, so treat him as an enemy. Exactly. So we have to be aware. And you know, they say one of the biggest tricks that shaitan is pulled, uh, convincing man that he doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And that, if you were to think about it, how many times do we remember that we have this entity within us that wants to destroy us? And those racing minds, racing thoughts, right? It all comes because you're only going to sin, right? When you're in... A state, a state of discontentment yeah. Or right. you're uneasy Or you're irritable And you're restless And uh, you're not in a state of peace And contentment And you're not in this relationship with Allah So what we have to do actually, We have to stop judging Everything and anything that's going on And again You know Try to develop this relationship Where you're submitted To the will of Allah Right Because many times uh, Like I'm sure you can relate actually, I'm sure you can relate Right So all of us me, We may have gone through things That at the time It seemed terrible and you know, uh, you know, very uh, bad. But so much fruits came out of that thing that happened, right? And then we became grateful for it a year down the line. You know, two years down the line. Alhamdulillah. So um, yeah, it's very important to stay out of that mind because this is where the addiction. If you were to talk about addiction, the addiction lives in the mind. Right. I um, I wanna um. I think that one of the, one of you, the cameras is gonna is, is starting to play up because we've had it on for such a long time. And I think it's been about two hours, alhamdulillah, Mashallah, which has been, been amazing. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And it's felt like a, a much shorter amount of time. Um, but so I want to let's let's round up, um, and inshallah the the camera remains for it. Um, well, let's round up by by having a direct conversation with the one who is listening right now and wants to make a change uh, for the positive. Um, What's your message? And any any of you two or both of you two can reply, inshallah. I would say reach out. Don't let the problem grow. Addiction thrives in isolation, right? Um, and, uh, you know, you're alone, you're with your nafs. You're with the qareen, right? And you're going to be with the inner addict, right? Reach out to brothers. And, you know, in a wise way, get out and reach for hope and start solving this problem. Um, that would be my advice. 
think as well, yeah, similar, similar thing. I mean, acknowledge your weakness, acknowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one that can help you resolve this problem. And that you have a Lord that is well aware of the problems that you are going through. And that don't think for one second in your, in your mind that no one knows the struggles I go through. You have a Lord that knows you inside out. He knows the deepest secrets that you have that no individual knows. And his door is open. As you know, Muhammad Sallallahu he said in a hadith that, you know, the, the, the door of Toba is open, you know, until uh, the sun rises from the west, for example. Well, not only that, know that Muhammad Sallallahu said that Allah said that if my servant comes to me walking, I come to him running. Initiate that process. Allah says, فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ Remember me, I'll remember you. So what we're saying as well, and I'm reiterating the point that Abu Musa mentioned, is that let us deal with it as a community. Let us deal with it face on. Let us tackle it and understand the yields and the consequences of what this has done to our society, our youth, our married individuals, you know, to people in their work life, people that had ambitions, prospects. And let us help take it on with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jizak, go ahead. Okay, just to give some uh, practical yeah, 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 tips. Yeah, of course, right? of course, of course. Basically, obviously, first of all, I was saying about reaching out, right? That's yep. the main solution. Uh, being part of a recovery community. Secondly, the surrender aspect, right? Don't try to use willpower anymore. Connect with Allah. Hand over your day to Allah. Hand over all the temptations and struggles to Allah. Thirdly, remember, you are not your addiction, as I said, right? You are not your addiction. So separate the two mm. and start dealing with the inner addict like it needs to be dealt with. Uh, fourthly, change your routine, right? Because your routine, like I was mentioning, it's uh, you know, fueling the addiction right now. Change your routine and develop and nurture your relationship with Allah and journaling as well, Allah. right? Journal your feelings, right? On a daily basis, write down what's, uh, what's happening, what you're going through, your past, whatever it may be, and then you will start to learn what keeps coming up and what are the problems that are really driving you towards this addiction. So those are some practical things that everyone can implement, inshallah. And ultimately, it all boils down to our relationship with Allah. So we need to uh, work on that on a daily basis. Jazakallah khair for well, joining me. I really, really appreciate it. It was an amazing, insightful episode. Uh, I think it's going to benefit a lot. Uh, thank you so much for coming down. And uh, inshallah, you guys will be back soon. Inshallah. 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 Great, pleasure. Great pleasure for us. Thank you guys for listening. This yeah. was Freshly Grounded, uh, episode 197 or something. Uh, and we will see you again next week. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.